Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Today is Tuesday, October 11, 2022. This is uh, another day of trial in the case of State of Ohio Plaintiff versus George Washington Wagner IV, case number 2018-CR-155. The defend defendant is present in court today with his attorneys John Parker and Richard Nash. The state is represented by prosecuting attorney Rob Junk and by special prosecuting attorneys Angela Canepa and Andrew Wilson. Uh, also, Ryan Scheider, with a uh, special agent with Ohio BCI, and I is present in court. Uh, is counsel for both sides ready to have the jury go out? On behalf of the state, yes, you are. Your Honor. One thing we'd like to address before the jury is brought out. Um, Judge, it appears today that the state's next witness is going to testify about a search warrant executed at Time W. And uh, as you may see from looking over at the bench there, there are many boxes of evidence here. We anticipate that uh, they're going to attempt to introduce probably 15 to 20 firearms uh, that are not related to the murders. Uh, and we know they're not related to murders because they've recovered the murder weapons pursuant to Jay's statement, and these are not them. And so you know our position on this. I'm quite sure it's in Joe Thomas' case. Looking at the inventory list of, of what's contained in these various boxes, you know, there are numerous firearms uh, that simply are not part of the aggravated murder. And, and so under Thomas, it's improper to introduce this type of evidence in this case. Uh, many of the weapons are, are 22 rifles, um, and other types of weapons, a 12-gauge shotgun, many other types of weapons that clearly are not related to the murders as this testified over the last several weeks. So it's, it's our position that this is not admissible, that these guns and the ammunition related are not admissible unless it's directly tied to the aggregate murders, which these items are not. Could we have an explanation from the state? Uh, because we're getting in here to other weapons that, uh, according to the defense counsel, are not related to the uh, homicides in this case. Do you have a yes, detailed explanation about why these should come in? Yes, as we've discussed before, it's for the exact same reason that the court will let us bring in uh, the spent shell casings that were on the list. The guns we'll be bringing in here, see, would be on the list that were, was taken from George Wagner's phone, which, yeah, Jake Wagner's phone, which uh, I can even, even give you some of these, the like Beretta 92s uh, are on the list. These guns are actually on that list. It's the same exact reason that we put forth that the, the court let us show the, uh, the 22 Warner round because it's 22 Warner listed on here, or 22, uh, 22 calibers, uh, not in nine millimeters, and those. The, uh, these guns, I'll give you an example, uh, Remington 870 Wingmaster, those are listed on the list that were taken from Jake Wagner's phone as far as uh, you know, who has what. And we're seeking to show that this, in fact, is not in any way, shape, or form any type of wish list as put forth by the defendant, George Wagner. That's the exact reason. Okay, we're not, and we would be happy with the court giving a cautionary instruction on this as well. We're not bringing these in to show that uh, you know, just because they have a bunch of guns or anything like that. Or, and I can tell you, like, I have more guns than this in my house, and it doesn't mean I'm going to do anything with them. As far as, as, far as these particular guns, they're on, they're on the list, and some of them, the 22s, even had to be checked out by Matt White to be ruled out as the uh, 22 caliber homicide weapon. Because at this point, yeah, at this point, it hadn't been narrowed down as far as the uh, exact 22 caliber cold wall. Matt White still had a little more work to do. Explain how the fact that they're on that list that you keep making reference to, what that list is, what you're, you feel the evidence is going to show that list is, and how that makes them relevant 
in this in the prosecution of this case. Yes, Your Honor. This list was taken from uh, Jake Wagner's phone. And the defendant was actually interviewed about this list by BCI agents. And he, and he said words to the effect of, well, this is the wish list of the guns they wanted to get. By showing that there, these guns actually existed, you, that refutes that whole statement right out of the water. And could, the actual uh, guns of the type of them, the homicide weapons, such as SKS 762 by 39 and the uh, Colt 1911-22, are on this list. Your Honor, if I may just supplement what Mr. Junk is, is um, relaying to the court. So this list was taken from Jake Wagner's phone. It's a gun list, and it says what guns they own and who it specifically owns them, right? So George owns certain guns, Jake owns certain guns, Billy owns certain guns, Angela, Sophia, Holbein, I'm not sure Holbein's on that. But at some point when we are listening to them on the recordings, there is great effort on the part of George and somewhat on part, on part of Jake to describe this as a wish list. So in other words, these are not guns we owned. These are guns we hoped one day to own, right? The fact that one of the reasons that he wanted to make us a believer of that is because the SKS is listed as belonging to George Wagner, and the SKS is one of the weapons that um, fired at Chris Sr. So, um, so there's reason for him to want to get this, convince us that this is a wish list. The fact that these guns exist are recovered from Wagner residence and show that they actually exist, and they're not just a wish list, um, helps us. Additionally, there was actually more shell casings at uh, Peterson Road that match the guns on this wish list too, or this list too, um, which demonstrate that it's not a wish list, it's the guns that they actually own. So, um, so to the extent that they appear on this list, we believe they should be allowed because they prove that these are actual guns that exist versus they just hoped one day to own them. Um, and also, Matt White had not yet narrowed in on the Walter Colt as being the contributor to um, scenes two and three. Um, and so some of these weapons were test fired by Matt White to rule them in or rule them out as being the, one, the weapons that um, were fired at the current crime scenes. Now are you saying that the, uh, the, the weapons used in the homicide are on that list? Two of them are. Yeah. One, one is listed as belonging to uh, George Wagner, and the other is listed as belonging to Jake. And Jake will tell, him, tell us that George, in fact, had the SKS and pointed it at, you know, leveled it at uh, Chris Sr., and that he used the 1911. So, again, that's, you know, corroboration as well. But, um, again, when we are listening to the recordings, there's great effort on the part of George to describe this as a wish list. Um, and so, we feel it's our burden to prove that this was, in fact, weapons that no, they no, you're saying a, you're saying a recording. What well, up on the T3. What is it? During the T3, when we were listening to their recordings when Jake and he were riding together in uh, the r &L truck and also their phones. I thought the prosecutor said it was an actual Yeah, statement. Yeah, that, that was not, that was not, that, that was a misstatement. Yeah, apologize. But he does, again, go to great lengths to describe it as a wish list when it's being recorded. And he even says in the recording that he knows we're listening to him. So, in essence, he's talking to us. Yeah, one of the points uh, yeah. that the existence of these guns and the fact that some of these guns on a wish list found on Jake's phone are then later found with the Flying W, and that some of those guns are listed with this defendant being the owner, is independent proof of the existence of the, the conspiracy. As a matter of fact, one of the guns recovered from the Flying W, which is at uh, Beretta 9mm is a gun that he bought five days after the home of that side. We've already produced evidence of that receipt. <coughs> the gun was recovered again at the flying W. Now again, an inference or an argument that we can make from that direct evidence is that he bought that gun to replace a gun that they used, that 40 cal that they used to, to commit the murders. So that's, that's all part of the independent evidence of the existence of the conspiracy that lays the foundation for us to be able to get other evidence in. So again, that's how it's important, that's how it plays. Yeah. A couple of things. One, this so-called gun list was created by Jake more than a year before the murders. All right? 
They cannot link these guns to that list. They can link the type of gun, but there's nothing specific as a serial number or any other way. And as the court is well aware, there are many, you know, how many 22 whatevers are there, how many track guns are there, how many 9 millimeters are there. So this list one was created by Jake more than a year before the murder. Okay? Uh, number two, they know that these are not related to the aggravated murders because Jake in April of 21, when he gave his statement, gave information which led them to the weapons used, which are not these. So it doesn't matter that this was part of their investigation. I appreciate that this was part of their investigation, but now that Jake has, has, has basically turned over the murder weapons to them, this is not relevant. All right? This might have been relevant during the investigation, but it's not relevant at the trial because now we know where the weapons are. They have them. This is simply propensity evidence. And, and, uh, you know, and there are other items other than weapons here that, uh, that I believe they're going to introduce or attempt to, which includes such things as a, a bulletproof vest and other things like that, which Jake doesn't mention at all in his proffer or when he gave information. So this is, this is, these are items that are not related to the homicides in any way, shape, or form. They're simply guns that my client or others, perhaps, uh, that they seized at the Flying W, uh, who they belong to. They're, they're completely legal. There's nothing illegal about them. There's nothing about my client's background that would prohibit him from having anything like this. And they're completely independent of the homicides. And that's what Joe Thomas is all about. Joe Thomas case, that you can't bring in evidence of weapons that aren't related to the homicides because it's improper other acts, it, it's propensity type evidence, and it's simply not allowed. And so it, I understand they're trying to present this case in some sort of sequence about how the investigation went down, but there are aspects of it. Uh, once, that they, once they get Jake's statement and once he leads them to the murder weapon, that simply to make this that type of evidence irrelevant. We're not contesting. There's no question that these uh, aren't related to the homicides. It's maybe without Jake rec providing the guns, maybe they can make an argument these could have been the murder weapon, but that argument is gone because Jake has led them to the murder weapon. So this is exactly the type of evidence that, that the Joe Thomas case talks about is not proper. But if the list were made prior to the homicides, how, how do you argue that it certainly was not that the, one of the homicide weapons, which were later recovered, was not a weapon on this list. The 1911 on the list, for example. All right, let's talk about the homicide weapons. The 1911 that Jake says he used, all right, that's recovered pursuant to his statement. It's not here in the court, all right? The SKS that Jake says he fired, not my client, Jake says he fired the SKS, that's recovered pursuant to Jake's statement. That's not here in the court. The um, 40 caliber that was used, um, that was recovered uh, pursuant to Jake's statement. That is not in the court. All right? So that's the, pro that's, that's the problem with bringing this evidence in, is it's not directly tied. And this wish list, you know, they keep talking about it as a wish list. They haven't laid the foundation for that yet. All right? And it's certainly Jake's list. Um, Jake will describe it however he describes it. Um, but it's, one, the timing of it, yes, it's before the homicide, but you know, would that even matter to them because they want to bring in evidence of a gun my client legally purchased after the homicides, all right, which clearly could have been used. Uh, so, you know, Judge, this, this evidence is fraught with problems because, because of Jake's statement and what they found as a result of that. We're not arguing that the, that the majority of these weapons are relevant to the homicide itself. We are arguing that it is very relevant to the state's case, and to, to the state's theory of this case. And again, false exculpatory statements that George made about this being weapons they didn't own, that, but weapons that they hoped to own, it, is indicia of guilt. And it's specifically because, again, that SKS is listed as belonging to him. That's why he wanted to distance himself from this. So to the extent that we can show that the weapons on that list were actually owned by them, then we should be permitted to do so. 
We are, this has nothing to do with Thomas. We are not introducing this to say, you know, they're homicidal maniacs because they owned all these weapons. That is false. And again, we, are, we welcome cautionary uh, instruction. It, and again, I would note for the record, you know, we all saw the jurors' uh, questionnaires. We have many avid gun owners. We are in no way going to say because you own a gun that you committed these homicides. However, this is extremely relevant to the state's case, and specifically as it pertains to George Wagner. So it, the state should be allowed to talk about any weapons that appear on this list to establish their existence. There they are. Well, you, you don't have in evidence yet his denial of the list. No, right? but we also don't have Jake's statement that they keep talking about right. that say that which guns were used in the homicides. Of course not. We're officers of the court. We're making an argument. There was no motion to suppress filed as to this evidence. So now we're arguing it in the middle of trial. So we're left with providing the court what we know the evidence will be. And as I'm standing here, there are recordings that we cannot manipulate or change of George Wagner saying this is a wish list not that they did not actually own them. And so, to that extent, we should be allowed to do this. The concerns in Thomas are not pertinent here. They're just not. Those were knives, and they said that the uh, existence of them and the ownership of them did not, in, did not establish use of the, uh, the, uh, the knives, right? Because there's... Well, how, how is the jury going to use this if you don't have the statement in that he's denying it and you're bringing this in to well, show... I mean, how's the jury going to see this? When they ultimately hear George's recordings from the 2018 wiretaps, and we make our closing arguments, we will make that all go together. Again, I, there's no requirement that we play his statement saying that this is a wish list um, before we bring this in. I mean, we're, we're putting in the Walmart receipt um, you know, we had Suzanne Elliott come in and say, oh, these are the shoes that were worn, and we went and got all the videos. Uh, that was before anybody knew that the Walmart receipt was found in their belongings. I mean, obviously we have to show evidence along the way, and then we connect it up. Um, again, this is not propensity evidence. There is nothing that the state is going to ever say in its closing or anything else. Somebody, somebody suggested a, a, a cautionary instruction, but... I, I, how do I give a cautionary instruction about something that's not in evidence at this point? It, yes, uh, so I, I hear what the court's saying. So usually, like for instance, other acts evidence, you would say it, it goes to, you can use it to consider this, but not this. I think I would welcome a cautionary instruction that just says what you can't consider for, right? This, you know, the fact that they owned weapons or these weapons were recovered at the residence cannot be considered by you as propensity evidence to suggest that, you know, just they own weapons, they committed these homicides. I think that would be a fair, or something along those lines would be a fair cautionary instruction. Um, at the close of the case, you know, when the court's giving instructions to the jury, you know, I think this is going to be one of those instructions that has to be added if, you know, there was evidence that there were numerous weapons um, or several weapons recovered from the Wagner residence. That can only be considered by you as far as, you know, the existence of the weapons on this list. Um, and I mean, suppose you could say that now. We said that it came from Jake's phone. The other thing that I would add, Your Honor, is I, I think Ms. Never made a, a great point. There, sure, there, there, the evidence of this defendant's statement on that wire is not before the jury yet. But there's also no evidence before the jury that these weapons aren't involved in and they keep making this argument that none of these weapons are actually the, the, the murder weapons, but that's not before the jury right now. And again, we have to continue to show how the investigation will firearms out as not being the murder weapons. The other thing, too, is all of, all of this evidence right here, that list, the existence of these guns together over at the Flying W, even though we know that they belong to, to some of them belong to the defendant, they, they are directly probative to the defendant's identity as a member of this conspiracy. And, and the defense is trying to drive a wedge and keep him out of that conspiracy. But, but this evidence, again, shows that he is a, a member of that conspiracy. And again, we'll tie it up later with his efforts to hide what the conspiracy does by making the statements. But the fact that a gun he purchased five days after the homicide and it is now found at the flying W is something that we can argue shows that he's 
part of the conspiracy. The other thing, too, is a lot of the defense arguments, they go to weight, not in this code. They, they, they go to the weight. They, they can argue all they want that none of these guns, you know, are, are, have serial numbers on them that match the list. That's a weight argument. That, that's not an admissibility argument. So, again, it's directly probative and near to, to the defendant's participation in the conspiracy, and it's narrowly tailored uh, to, to avoid the purpose of the argument. Yes, kind of, we know what the weight weapons are, right? They've recovered them. They're not here. We know what the murder weapons are because the ballistic expert testified about the unique stamp of COVID 19 11 leaves on the shell cases. That's not here. We know, uh, although it's not in evidence yet, but we know that Jake fired the SKS and the 22, and we're going to argue he fired 40 as well at the various crime scenes because that's what Jake told me. All right? And we know that my client didn't fire any weapons because that's what Jake told me. So that's why this effort should not be done. Well, I've, I've ruled uh, previously on a uh, motion in limine, and I've denied it. So I'm going to uh, continue to deny it as a motion in limine. I, uh, I do intend to give an incarcerated instruction that the, that the uh, introduction of uh, these weapons cannot be uh, considered by the jury as evidence of uh, well, uh, what illegal activity? I don't know. Uh, it's not. How do you want me? To, what do you suggest? Yeah, does not show propensity. Cannot be used to show propensity to commit crimes. To commit crimes. But typically, we would also tell them what it can be used to do, but which we, which we at this point cannot do because we don't have the uh, list. Yes. Well, we do have the list. Actually. Well, we don't have a denial of the list. We don't have the denial of the list, but we do have that that list came from Jake's phone. So I suppose you could say to the extent that you find that they are on the list that Jake was extracted from Jake's phone and or could have been used in the murders, because again, they, they are test fired. Okay. Your Honor, the, the absence of that SKS from this search and the fact that it's listed under the defendant on that list and is later recovered as a murder weapon is in and of itself substantive evidence of the, the conspiracy and his participation. Right. Judge, Judge, the list has not been admitted to evidence yet. Jake hasn't testified about it, nor has it. I mean, it's, it's, it's been published. It, it's, it's recovered. I agree. It's been published, but it's not been admitted. It, what if Jake comes in and doesn't tie that together? Right? I mean, that's that. It doesn't matter. It came from his phone. It came from his phone. And it's got two suspected murder weapons on it. One of the two. It already has a weight argument. They keep saying it's the weapon, the weapon, the weapon. They don't know that. That's a weight argument. They don't know that. They're making several assumptions. All right. Well, I'm going to deny the motion for an in, as an in limine motion. You can preserve your uh, objections, of course, and I do intend to give them. Jury and cautionary instruction. So, are we now ready to have the jury vote? Yes. 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 Yes.
may be seated. Good morning. It's to see all of you here. Um, we begin another day of trial in this case, uh, you're aware, and we're, we are uh, in the state side of the case. I believe we have just concluded with a witness on uh, Friday. And so is the state ready to call another witness? Um, yes, Your Honor. The state would be called Special Agent Ryan Scheider to swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, but you shall answer unto God. Yes, I do. You see the state may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. And Agent Scheider, could you go ahead and just state your name again for the record? Ryan Scheider. I believe this is your third time testifying? Correct. Um, and can you tell us, um, again, just to kind of reacclimate everybody, I believe you indicated that you were present for the search warrants on both, well, May 10th, you conducted a uh, search of the inside of that residence at Peterson Road, correct? Yes. And then you were also present um, for the search warrants that were conducted on May 12th of 2017 at both Peterson Road and State Route 41, correct? Correct. Okay. And... You were aware of the outcome of those search warrants as well, correct? Yes. And for instance, um, the May 10th uh, search warrant at Peterson Road, there were some cartridge casings that were collected by Brian White, correct? Yes. And you were aware that those were submitted to Matt White, correct? Yes. And that he in fact made a positive um, identification of those cartridge casings as being identical to the ones that were covered from scenes two and scenes three. That's correct. Okay. And that, in fact, is what you then used to get an additional search warrant for to do a more extensive search of Peterson Road and also uh, State Route 41, correct? Correct. And were you also, did you also become aware of the fact that the cartridge casings that were collected during the May 12th um, search warrant also were identified by Matt White as coming from the same weapon that was used to kill the victims at scenes two and scene three. Yes. Okay. Um, were you also made aware of the burned up DVR that was found in the burn pit um, at 260 Peterson Road? Yes, I was. Yeah. Um, additionally, were you made aware of the findings at State Route 41? Yes, and I was present at that scene most of the day, too. Okay. And specifically, you were aware of the Walmart receipt that was found in a plastic tub in one of the vehicles, um, and that Angela was found on the Walmart images to be the person purchasing that on the date and time that appeared on the Walmart receipt. Yes. Correct? And did you also um, learn that Special Agent Jenkins had gone to a Walmart to confirm what shoes or what items the SKU on that receipt came back to? Yes. I was, I was also involved in that discussion in the, in the process of sending him a copy of the receipt. Okay. So you sent him a copy of the receipt, and did you also receive... Um, Confirmation back from him. Yes. Okay. First of all, I'm going to approach you with what has previously been marked as CC265. And the receipt present um, in that, and do you recognize what that receipt is? Yes. On the evidence number six, which is CC265, it is a Walmart receipt dated. You can't see. I, I can't read it, but it, it does have the athletic shoes on it, uh, and it is dated 4-7 of 16 at 1658 hours. Okay. Um, the very first one. 
And as part of Special Agent Jenkins' work in this case for you, um, actually physically going to the Walmart <coughs> and comparing the SKU yes. on the receipt. Did Special Agent Jenkins also send you pictures from his uh, location? Yes, he did. Okay. Showing you what has been marked as State's Exhibit L, L1. And can you tell us um, what we are looking at there? Can you tell us what we're looking at there? This is one of the photographs that Special Agent Jenkins forwarded back to myself and others at the State Route 41 scene. And this is the 10 and a half Walmart shoes, athletic shoes. Okay. And showing you what's been marked in the LL2. And again, can you tell us what that is? This is a close up of the tag for those shoes and it shows the SKU number at the bottom which is consistent with the uh, last item purchased on the Walmart receipt which was scanned twice and then there, there was a removal of it. Okay. And again, so ultimately there was one item purchased. One ten and a half. One ten and a half. Correct. Okay. And specifically, can you tell us, if you look at the receipt, can you tell us what the SKU number is there that corresponds with this 10 and a half? Yeah, on, the, on the receipt it is 0538819662. Okay, which appears on the screen in front of you on that size 10 and a half tag. Correct. Okay, and then LL3, And again, can you tell us what we're looking at? Again, this is one of the photographs that Agent Jenkins sent myself, and this would be the tread for the 10 and a half shoe. Okay. And you can see the 10 and a half right here. Okay. And then LL4. This is a store tag for a size 11 uh, Walmart athletic shoe. Sorry. That is actually LL4. It is currently up there now. All right. Again, another photograph that Special Agent Jenkins sent myself when he went to the new Boston Walmart of Walmart brand gray athletic shoes, size 11. And then LL5. Another photograph that was sent by Special Agent Jenkins to myself. This is a close-up of the uh, tag for those shoes, uh, highlighting the size 11, as well as the SKU number. And again, can you tell us what the SKU number is on the receipt that corresponds with that size 11 athletic shoe? Zero six zero five three eight eight one nine six six three. So again, that matches what we see there on the screen as belonging to the size 11 uh, gray shoes. Correct. Okay. And then LL6. Again, another photograph that was sent by Special Agent Jenkins to myself. This is the tread or bottom side view of those shoes, 
highlighting the size 11. Okay. And were you already familiar with those particular shoes? Yes. And how were you familiar with them? Through Suzanne. She had already told us that, you know, this is what we were looking for. Okay. And you have actually had seen actual um, physical ones of them? Correct. Yes. Okay. So, Special Agent Scheider, can you tell us, um, when you were conducting the searches at 260 Peterson Road and State Route 41, and I believe you had testified previously that um, a neighbor had informed you that all of the Wagner belongings that had been packed in those trailers were up, up at that location on State Route 41, correct? Correct. And when you were conducting a search of those properties, both Peterson Road and State Route 41, were some of the items that you were looking for um, weapons that would be consistent with the weapons used in these homicides? Yes. Okay. And can you tell us, um, were you also looking for items that were on the list that uh, you had extracted from Jake's phone? Yeah. yeah. Specifically, we were looking for those items that were on the list, but also to be potential contributors from the crime scenes. So that's that's one of the things we were looking for, yes. Okay. And although you found ballistic evidence at Peterson Road, did you find any weapons that uh, match any of those uh, requirements? We did not find any weapons that were potential contributors, correct. Okay. And the same question for State Route 41. Did you find any firearms during your search at State Route 41? No. Okay. So, can you tell us then, having searched uh, two properties belonging to the uh, Wagners, although Peterson Road, obviously, they had vacated, <coughs> correct, at the time of your search? Correct. Can you tell us, um, but State Route 41 purportedly had all of their belongings, correct? Yes. And were you aware of the ability of people to take weapons across the border when you're uh, crossing into Canada? Yes, so when Jake had told us that they were going to Alaska, one of the things that we weren't unsure of was how do you get firearms through Canada into Alaska? So we did make contact with uh, Customs and Border Patrol, HSI, Homeland Security, and asked them what those requirements were, we, and we were told that it was not possible unless they went through a firearms dealer. So with that knowledge, you know, we're pretty confident at that point, either they've shipped the, you know, any firearms that they used or they, they're <coughs> storing them somewhere else. So we had looked at Peterson Road, and we didn't locate the, the weapons there. And then we had also looked at State Route 41, where their personal belongings were being held, and the guns were not there. The only other place we were aware of at that time that the Wag that was associated with the Wagners was the Flying W Farms because Billy lived there. Okay. And had you made any efforts to rule out um, any other um, acquaintances that they had that they might be storing them with or not? Yes. Tell us about that. So we were aware of the friends named Roten with a T. Uh, they were friends of the Wagners. And while we were executing the search warrants at State Route 41 and 260 Peterson Road, we had agents that went to Virginia to, to meet with the Rotens to see if the firearms had been stored there, and they had not. Okay. So you indicated, again, you guys are continuously searching for where these weapons might be. Um, and you indicated that you decided to obtain a search warrant to search Flying W, correct? Yes. Okay. And why was that? Because that was the only other address at that time that we were familiar with that was associated to any of the Wagners. Specifically, Billy Wagner lived there. Okay. And so did you obtain a search warrant for the Flying W? Yes, we did. And did you recall when that was? 
the search warrant would have been executed May 13th, 2017. It was a Saturday. Okay. So the day immediately following the day that you searched, did the extensive search on Peterson Road and also the search at State Route 41? Correct. Okay. And were you present as well for that search warrant? Yes, I was. And if you could just tell us um, who all was involved, what agencies, et cetera, in that search warrant. At the Flying W, there was BCI. We had uniformed deputies from the Pike County Sheriff's Office. We had task force agents from a Ohio Organized Crime Task Force, which is a, just a, an a, a Attorney General's Office task force. We had The Franklin County SWAT team did the entry and secured the residence for us, and then we had the uh, Ohio Prison STAR team also assisted with the execution of that search warrant. Okay. Okay, I just wanted to follow up on some issues that um, have been raised as well. Um, there, were, there have been some questions about how covert you were trying to be during this time period leading up to the search warrant, so um, before the May 10th search warrant and then the subsequent search warrants. Um, we know that you asked Jake Wagner for his phone back in April of 2017, correct? Correct. And you were told no at that time? Correct. Then again, you talked to him on May 3rd, and I believe you testified you did not ask for his phone at that time, correct? Correct. Okay. And you also knew that you were um, likely going to get a search warrant for that phone, correct? Yes. And is, can you tell us, um, is part of the reason that you did not ask him for it on May 3rd is to prevent from spooking him and having him delete anything that's on the phone or suspecting that you're going to take it? Yeah. Prior to executing the second search warrant at Peterson Road, we still were pretty quiet about this. And one of the things we did not want to do was alienate the Wagners. From the investigation right we don't want them to know their targets of the investigation so it's that fine line of you're asking questions you're trying to get stuff from them but you're also trying not to alienate them and spook them to where they start destroying more evidence or, or concealing more evidence okay and there were some questions about other people participating in the search warrants that you guys conducted at um, peterson road and that during the second uh, search warrant on May 12th, the media found out somehow, correct? Yes. Okay. That is not because BCI alerted the media, correct? It was, we had no influence on that. I, I can assume that it was because of the large presence that that's how it leaked out, and it would have been the second day that we did a search there. Okay. And during that time, do you or anybody else from BCI talk to the media and provide any information whatsoever to them? No. Okay. And specifically, there was discussion about, um, at some point, the Attorney General's office put out a um, statement requesting help or information with anybody who traded or bought, sold, or traded weapons or vehicles with the Wagners, correct? Yeah, so after the the second search of the 260 Peterson Road and the State Route 41 search, so that had been May 12th. You know, it's kind of out of the bag at that point. They know what's happening because there was helicopters flying around from the news media, and they had called us about it. They were alerted to it as well, so they had contacted me wanting to know what we were looking for. So at that point, um, it's, you know, it's out of the bag. They know we're, we're all, you know, we're focusing in on them. So after they moved to Alaska, on June 19th of 2017, the Attorney General's office released a media release asking people if they had, you know, any conversations with the Wagner family, had done any firearms transactions with them, ammunition transactions, or vehicle transactions to please come forward with that information. And that was June 19th of 2017. Okay. So, well over a month after you did the search at Peterson Road. Correct. And in that press release, or any press release, was the caliber of weapons that you were looking for ever released to the public? No, it was not released until a bond hearing for the defendant. Okay. 
And that was after, almost um, two years after the arrest. Correct. Somebody comes forward. So we did this press release on June 19th of 2017 asking people to come forward. So if we we need to keep what we know close to our chest, right? So if to, to if somebody comes forward and says, well, I know it was this gun, I need to protect that. So the only way to protect is we don't tell anybody what kind of weapons were used. So that's how we, we give people credibility. If they come forward and say, hey, you know, I know on this date and time that Jake Wagner had a you know 22 pistol. Well, if I've not released that information, then that's something I need to follow up on. But if they tell me, say, oh, I had a discussion with Jake Wagner, and he told me that he used a 12-gauge shotgun, and I know there's not a 12-gauge shotgun used, I know that the credibility of that statement goes way down. So we don't tell people. We Almost never do we tell people the caliber or, or suspected weapons in a homicide, because we want people to come forward, and that's how we judge their credibility. Okay. And in fact, to underscore that, there was a point where the media was interested in the autopsy reports in this case, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And BCI and the Attorney General's Office did everything to resist releasing those for the same reason, correct? Correct, because there would have been hints of what kind of caliber of, uh, weapons were used, and that information would have been, became public. And additionally, did you um, and your team take extra precautions by getting um, a special judge and a special clerk appointed in this case? Yes. So one of the things we did in this specific case... One of the things we did in this case was... Uh, asked that a special judge be appointed for Pike County and Adams County, I believe Madison County, maybe one additional county to handle basically search warrants and court orders uh, specific just to this case so that we kind of controlled the, uh, the flow of information. It was more controlled that way. Okay, and all of those were placed under seal as well? They were all sealed in a separate county, the, all the court orders were. And finally, at the time of the search warrant on Peterson Road, when that ballistic evidence was collected, May 10th and May 12th, um, did anyone yet know that a Walther Colt had been used in this offense? No. At that time, all we knew was there was a 22 long rifle, a 30 caliber rifle, and then a 40 caliber. And that we knew was a Glock because Matt White had told us it was a Glock. But we did not know the contributors to the 30 caliber or the 22 long rifle at the time. Okay. And you've heard testimony from Matt White regarding ultimately learning that this was a Walther Colt. But um, do you have knowledge of when that discovery was made? Yes. yes. <coughs> that, that did not occur until July of 2017. So again, a couple months after the search. And that was via our lab in Bowling Green had come across a similar type of firearm. Objection. And I believe you indicated that you, you were present for the search warrant that was conducted at the Blind W, correct? Yes, I was. Okay. And is it true that um, when you are present at a search warrant, that part of your role as lead investigator in this case is to direct the crime scene agents to uh, let them know what you are looking for or what, what they should be looking for? Yeah, so the, the job of the lead agent, at least at BCI, is to, you know, you formulate the, the direction of the case. So um, let's say at the, at the Flying W search warrant, my job is to make sure that you know, the warrants get signed, that we have a ops plan, that you know, different duties are assigned out so that people have you know, job duties, and then I take in all that information. So everything gets reported back to me to let me know what the findings are, and then you know, I confer with other people to say, you know, yes, we think that's relevant, or no, we don't think it's relevant. Okay. 
So basically the lead agent does a lot of coordinating and organization of the case itself and the investigation. Okay. I have another question, Mr. Thank you. Likewise. All right, just a few questions, sir. Um, on the Walmart receipt that you testified to, that states exhibit what's number 265. 265. Yeah. All right, what else is on the receipt that was purchased that day? One of the items is wipes. I'm not sure what the next item is because it's abbreviated too much. And then good nights, gas release, ga gas relief. Hanes, then the athletic shoe, cough syrup, then the athletic shoe, the second scan of the second pair of athletic shoe, and then a voided entry of the athletic shoe. And again, I don't know what that second item is. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of numbers and letters, so I, I don't know what that means. Uh, you didn't investigate to find out what that meant? I'm sure it was looked into, but I do not know. And there were only two pairs of shoes purchased, correct? Correct. Now, you just testified concerning um, the searches of Peterson that we went through last week. Just a couple follow-up questions, if I could. Um, you had talked to you had, you and another agent had gone to 260 Peterson um, around the anniversary of the murders to talk to him, correct? Talk to Jake. To talk to Jake. Correct. And, and you talked to Jake and Andrew. On separate, yes, those were separate events. Well, okay, let's take them one at a time. All right, the first time you went to 260 Peterson, you talked to Jake, correct? Yes, in April of 2017. Is in that April. what you're okay. Yes, sorry, yes, yes. In April of 2017, you and another agent went to 260 Peterson and you talked to Jake and Andrew, correct? No, no. You only talked to Jake? Correct. Okay, fine. Let's talk about that. What was Jake doing when you were? I don't remember what he was doing at, at that event. I, I, I'm not sure if he was in the residence or if he was outside of that on that one. All right. Do you remember where you talked to him? Yes, it was around the fire pit. And again, I'm not, I can't remember if it was at a picnic table or if it was on a bench at that fire pit. Okay, but it was outside. Correct. Outside the residence. And you recorded that conversation? Absolutely. Right. And that was a secret recording like you always do. We're not required to tell people we record them. Correct. So that's a secret recording that you don't tell people. It's a standard operating procedure. Right. It's a secret recording that you didn't tell. I didn't make it secret. No, I just record. I, I always do that. Right. If you don't tell somebody you record it. I'm going to object to him. Are we going to do this? Not are you trying to get an answer? Well, all of them were objection to you. You did not tell him, which is your normal procedure. Correct. Um, I did not tell him. Record. Correct. And Jake lied to you about many things on that recording. Correct. On that specific recording, I mean, I guess I would need more details to exactly what you're talking about. Well, he told you he didn't, he didn't admit to the crimes, correct? I don't know that I ever asked him if he did the crime on, during that recording, but no, he never confessed during that. All right. Are you telling us he was truthful during that recording? Again, you would have to tell me a specific thing that we're talking about. In general, I can't. I mean, I can't answer in general. Did he confess? No. All right. And you, you don't know whether it was true, right? I don't remember asking him specific questions about the homicides during that. Right. Did you ask him who he thought did the crime? Either in that one or the next one, yes. All right, let's talk about the next one. The next one was when, in comparison to the May 3rd, some, somewhere in there. And you arrived again with another officer, another agent, correct? Right? Yes. All right. Once again, you recorded the conversation. Yes. All right. And what was Jake doing when you arrived this time, if you remember? George, Jake, and Angela were loading up their personal belongings into the trailers. Into which trailers? The, the one that was there at the time would, would have been the black livestock trailer with the uh, sides that were covered, I, and I don't remember how they had them covered, if it was tarps or boards, but it was the black livestock trailer. All right, so they were they were packing their belongings because they had sold the property? Correct. Okay. 
And in that particular interview, Jake and Angela are on the recording, correct? Yes. All right, George is not on that recording. Correct, he excused himself. Well, he didn't, ex he didn't say anything that's on the recording, correct? He left as soon as I arrived. Right, he left. He's not on that recording. Correct. You did not follow him and say, hey, George, I want to talk to you. Correct. And on that recording, that's, is that, is that, is the question, that's the question. Is that when Jake told you they were going to Alaska? There was conversation of that, but I believe the first time would have been the previous one in April. Okay, so in April, Jake told you they were going to Alaska. Correct. So that's the first time you learned that they were going to Alaska. Correct. And you knew that they were going to Alaska from that point forward. There was discussions. I don't know that it was, I don't think it was exact or definite that they were going, but there was discussions of them going correct. Correct. And, and you, as a PCI agent and your partner, you knew that. Because yes, they made us aware of that, or Jake made us aware of that, Angela did, yes. Right. And Jake told you uh, in the May conversation, the one in May, that these belongings were going to be stored somewhere. Is that right? I think he mentioned that, yes. So Jake is the one that told you were going, that they were going to Alaska. He told you where the, where the, the their belongings were going to be stored while they went to Alaska. Yes. And that was at Route 41 that we saw last week. I, I don't think he said State Route 41. I believe he provided a name. And do you know what that name was? Bernie Brown. Or, and again, I don't know if he said the wife's name or, or the husband's name, but the right. Brown residence. And, and that was the Bernie Brown property that we saw on Route 41. Yes. And, and Jake lied to you at that May statement about different aspects of the Again, I guess you have to clarify what statements are you talking well, you about reference to. Him, who he got committed to crime. Yes, I did ask him that. Right. And he denied knowing he committed the crime. Correct, he didn't offer a suspect, correct. And Angela is on that recording too. Yes. And you asked her similar questions. The questioning was to both of them in general. Right, because they were both there and you're there and you're talking to them. Correct. And they, and they lied to you. Yes. talked about the June 19th press release. Uh, that's more than a year after the homicides, correct? Yes. And then certainly the media somehow found out about the second search in May at Petersburg, right? We just discussed that. Yes. All right, so people are getting information other than through these public press releases, right? That's fair to say. The public is getting information. What kind of information? <clears throat> information about the case. No. Well, the media showed up without you telling them about it, right? Right, but what information would they have obtained from that? The, the fact that we were doing a search warrant? Yes. Okay, that, that would have been it. That's as far as you know. Correct. Right. Did you question the media about where they got their information? No, I was too busy. Understood. I know you were busy. Uh, but it's certainly not unheard of or unusual for leaks during an investigation to get out to the public about certain aspects of the case. It's not unusual when law enforcement is executing a search warrant, especially ones those large, for the media to show up. Right. So they're, they're getting their Not necessarily through a leak. Pardon? It, could, it may not be through a leak. A neighbor could have called. Okay. But somehow they're getting information. Correct.
fact that they talked to you about the trip to Alaska, um, did they often describe it as a recon trip or a vacation? In other words, they weren't sure yet if they were going to actually move to Alaska. Correct. correct? There was conversations about going up and looking for somewhere to live, employment, as well as there was concerns about moving up there. Specifically, Billy was concerned. He did not, he, his, his statement to us was he did not want to go to Alaska because his father was sick. Okay. So at that time, you did not know for sure whether or not they were actually going to move to Alaska. Correct. Okay. I have no questions. And for the cross. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Stay here to call the witness. Yes, Your Honor. We'll be calling Lieutenant Brian White again. County Sheriff's Office. And direct your attention back to uh, <clears throat> May of 2017. It, for the record, were you employed as a uh, crime scene agent with the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation at that time? I was. During a part of your duties in May, specifically May 13th, were you detailed as a uh, part of the road mainly and Gilly homicides to serve a search warrant on the Flying W Farm here in Bike? Yes, sir. And do you know who requested the search warrant? Um, that would have been our special investigations unit um, from BCI. And what type of preparations did you do in regards to executing the search warrant? As far as... Um, at that point, were you still the uh, lead crime scene agent? Yes. Okay. As a lead crime scene agent, were there any particular steps Anything like that you took prior to the service as a search warrant? We met with uh, the investigating SIU or, or uh, the Special Investigations Unit, and they told us that they wanted to serve a search warrant. We knew that uh, the property was, was pretty large in size, so uh, we formulated a plan and got some additional manpower and just kind of put a plan together for manpower because we were going to need more uh, more manpower than what we needed. So we utilized uh, the STAR team from uh, Department of Rehabilitation and Correction. And we had several, um, I would say at least, uh, probably at least eight BCI agents along with the STAR team um, and assistance from the Pike County Sheriff's Office as well. And how did you divide up the search? We had more than one crime scene agent, so I did the outside, uh, searching of the outside and, and the outbuildings and uh, anything outside of the house itself. There was a house that sat on the property. Other crime scene agents and other SIU agents went inside the house and they did the search inside the house. Uh, there were STAR team members as well. Most of the STAR team members uh, were with me outside. Um, and prior to actually you know, searching, did you do a walk around on the outside of the Flying W area there? Yes. Hey, can you describe the scene for me when you got there? Well, you, you come off the road, uh, there's a, a big uh, W gate thing at the end of the driveway and you go through it. You take this long driveway back to the house area. Um, 
it's it's there's trees and pasture grass areas uh, several outbuildings there's ponds um, and it's just kind of all around the house area so the house kind of sits in the middle and did you take photographs of the exterior of the residents, the outbuildings, the barns that day? Yes, I did. Hey, just for the record, do you have any special training in crime scene photography or photography in general? Yes, I do. And what is that, sir? Uh, I've been through several, um, at least two crime scene photography classes through the Ohio Peace Officers Training Academy. I'm going to show you a series of pictures marked that. States exhibits DD2, DD3, DD4, DD6, DD15, 16, and 17. I'm going to ask you to identify those for us, please. Those are photographs of the exterior, part of the exterior uh, coming up the driveway to the residents there at Flying W. I took them on that day. And hey, Mr. Wilson, if you would be so kind just to pull up State's Exhibit DD2. Lieutenant White, if you would, uh, we've got State's Exhibit DD2 up. Just tell me what that is. That's coming uh, up the driveway uh, into the property of the Flying W. Would you take a look at DD3 for me, please? Again, that's the uh, same driveway uh, leading it into the property that flying W. And DD4. That's what just the exterior of one of the outbuildings uh, that's there on the property. Is that one of the uh, star team bands that's over in there? That's correct. That's a star team. And we proceed to Stacy Exhibit DD6, please. That's, uh, you see some vehicles there. Um, again, that's coming up the driveway to the Flying W. Um, you can see the, the gate I was talking about there um, at the edge of the driveway leading into the property. D, Stacy Exhibit DD15, please. That's the uh, Flying W gate that was there on the driveway. And DD-16? Same gate, just that there is that driveway, uh, just a medium range shot of it, photograph of it. And DD-17? That's the, that number one was already on the building, and that's just one of the buildings, the outbuildings that was there on the property. And did you ever uh, go inside with that building marked is that barn marked as building number one? Yes. And did you find anything you felt was uh, evidentially uh, significant in there? No. And do those uh, pictures you just reviewed truly and accurately depict the scenes you saw on May 13th of 2017? Yes, they did. I'm going to move on. Uh, I'm going to have you look at State's Exhibits DD 28. DD-58, DD-63, DD-64, DD-67, and DD-69. These are photographs of uh, the exterior of the residence there at uh, Flying W Ranch. Would you take a look at State's Exhibit DD28 and tell us what we're looking at? That's the side of the house. Um, you see two crime scene trucks parked there. Um, that's where we started the search of the house. 
And Mr. Wilson, if you could put up State's Exhibit DD58, please. That would be the front of the residence there on the property. And State's Exhibit DD63. And a photograph, an overview photograph showing the side, uh, one of the sides of the house, basically just going around <coughs> documenting the house. And the next picture, DD64. And again, that's standing in the driveway and then taking a photograph of that side of the house. And DD67. That's the side uh, we just saw just a, from a different angle. And next is DD69. Just tell us what we're looking at here, please. That's again the residence, and that's just a <coughs> screened in uh, glass addition type thing. And do those pictures you testified to truly and accurately depict the uh, scene of the flying W as you saw it on May 13, 2017? Yes. <laughs> Exhibits DD 47, DD 128, DD 139, DD 148, DD 163, DD 171, and DD 175. Those are photographs of outbuildings on the property. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD 47, please? What's that up, White? Tell us what we're looking at in this one. That's the driveway. That goes in front of the house. How far off the road would you say that the house and barns of Flying W would be? Like Camp Creek Road. They they set quite a distance off the road. They're way way off the road. States exhibit uh, DD one twenty eight. That's the building number one. The, this, like I said before, the number one was already on the building, and it's there on the property. That's what we consider the front. Okay, we move on to State's Exhibit DD 139. Again, that's the front of that building number one, and it's got a, a lean to type structure on the side of it. It's got a vehicle parked in it. And did you or any other agent search that lean to part? Yes, we did. Okay. Did you find anything that you collected as evidence there? No. Okay. You want to see exhibit DD-148? Tell us what we're looking at there. That's the um, building that's on the property, the front sliding doors. And did you enter into that building? Yes, we did. Hey, did you ever collect any evidence from that building? No, sir. Let's move on to DD-163, please, Mr. Wilson. Lieutenant, tell us what we're looking at here. That is Again, that number five was already on the building, but that's another one of the outbuildings that's on the property there, Flying W. That would be what we consider the front of that building. Did you collect any type of evidence from the inside of uh, building number five? No, sir. I'd like to move on to State's Exhibit DD-171. Would you tell us what we're looking at here, Lieutenant Lloyd? Those were just two trailers that 
appeared to be used for storage that were there on the property next to the building. And then there's a little shed right next to those two trailers uh, that was also on the property. Did you ever enter into and search inside those trailers in the, the trailers in the shed? Yes, sir. And did you collect any evidence from the interior? No, sir. Okay, I'd like to move on to State's Exhibit DD-175. That's a photograph showing, uh, focusing more on that shed that's next to the trailers. I'm going to hand you another stack of pictures. For the record, uh, there will be states exhibits DD-180, DD-182, DD-183, <coughs> DD-184, DD-192, DD-194, DD-195. DD-196, DD-197, DD-198, DD-199, DD-200, DD-206, DD-211, and DD-212. Those are photographs I took that day of several different outbuildings that were on the property. Hey, reviewing these pictures, did you take those yourself? Yes, I did. Do they truly and accurately reflect the scene at the Klein W Farm as you took it there that day back in 2017? Yes, it does. I'd like to start, uh, there's no like, quick way to do this. I'd like to start with States Exhibit DD-180, if we could. Can you tell us what we're looking at here, Lieutenant? That's the, again, that number eight was already on the building, <clears throat> but that's just a, another building that was on the property uh, there at Flying Dove. That's the front of it. Okay, can we have States Exhibit DD-182, please? More of a medium range photograph showing the same building. DD 183. That's the same building, just at a different angle. Photographs taken at a different angle. And Stacy Exhibit DD 184. What are we looking at there? That's standing in front of the building, and that's just showing the relationship between that building number eight and two of the other buildings that were also on the property. And can we go to State's Exhibit DD-192? That's a pen that was in between two buildings. Hey, was there any, any animals, livestock in the pen? Yeah. There was, uh, I believe there were uh, hogs or pigs in one, and uh, I think there were some horses in others. I can move on to Stacey Exhibit DD-194. That's, uh, again, that number nine was already on the building, and that's uh, building number nine that's just showing the front and side of it. Stacey Exhibit DD-195, please. And again, that's uh, that same building just showing the front. Yeah, it looks like it was a uh, I think, livestock. Yeah, I think it was a miniature <coughs> horse or horses or something in that building. State's Exhibit DD-195. Next one. Oh, I apologize. Yeah, I, was yeah. say, I am not a numbers person, so I apologize in advance. Uh, DD-196. That... This is a photograph of the livestock that was inside the building there. Hey, did you end up searching that building in any way? Yes, we did. Hey, did you find anything that you collected as evidence in there? We did not. 
Now let's move on to States Exhibit DD197, the next picture. That's again showing the fenced in area in between two of the buildings. And next picture, DD198. That's a photograph showing uh, building number 10, or, or that number 10 was already on the building, but it's another building that was on the property there at Flying W. And did you enter into that building and conduct a capital search in there? Yes, we did. And did you recover or collect any evidence in there? No, sir. And let's move to the next one, DD199. That's more of an overview photograph just showing building number 10 in the front of it. Well, let's move on to State's Exhibit DD200, please. That's uh, showing that fenced in area between the two buildings and sh just showing that there was livestock there on the property. Let's go to State's Exhibit DD206. So just a different different view of uh, Building 10, which you've already testified to? That's correct. Okay. And State's Exhibit DD-211. That's a photograph showing uh, the number 11 building. The, the number 11 was already on the building. <coughs> That's just a photograph, an overview photograph of that building. And, uh, you searched that building, collecting the evidence in the interior? We did search it. There, were no, there was no evidence collected. And let's move on to State's Exhibit DD-212, please. Another view of uh, the building you previously testified to? That's correct. Yet another uh, stack of pictures to look at. Those will be States Exhibits DD 223, DD 224, DD 225, and DD 248. You can take a look at those and see if you recognize them. Yes, those are photographs that I took that day at the Flying W of outbuildings and, and storage areas on the property. Can I start with State's Exhibit DD-223? Yeah, what are we looking at there? That's a trailer that was on the property and it sits in front of that building 11 that we just looked at. And did you conduct any type of search in that trailer? Yes. Did you collect any evidence in there? No, sir. And let's move on to the next picture, DD-224, please. <coughs> yeah, what are we looking at? Let's stand in, in the driveway area, um, real close to where we were at in the previous picture, but that's a uh, photograph in the opposite direction, so we're going away from the trailer in the building. And Mr. Wilson, we have the next picture in mind, DD-225. That's a photograph of, again, other buildings that were there on the property. Let's go to State's Exhibit DD-248. Hey, what are we looking at there? That's a trailer that was on the property. You know, sitting there for storage. And did you collect any evidence out of it? No, we did not. And I hand you another stack of pictures.
Show me what those are. For the record, these are pictures of our state's exhibits DD-230, DD-234, DD-237, DD-238, and DD-239. Those are photographs I took that day of, uh, outside of the Flying W. And do they truly and accurately reflect the scene as you yourself saw it back on May 13 and 27 of the Flying W car? They do. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit DB2 for please? What are we looking at there, Lieutenant? So that's outside of uh, the out, one of the outbuildings, and there's a few flags that you'll see there uh, in the yellow flags. That denotes uh, an item of uh, potential evidence, and when, so, when the search team would search, if they found something that they thought could potentially be evidence that they would place a flag and then I would follow up with it from there. Okay. What did you do to follow up once uh, the search team had come across the uh, items marked by the flags? So uh, when I, I would photograph it, and that's what one of the pictures we're looking at here, and then I would place an evidence placard there with a number and re-photograph it and then collect whatever item it is uh, as evidence. Let's move on to State's Exhibit that picture BB-234. So that's a photograph. You see the evidence placard is evidence number one there at the center of the photo. That's showing that that's evidence item number one. That's what that photo is representing. That's an overview photograph. And what did you find in the uh, open area there with the flags in your pocket? There were some cartridge cases. Let's move on to State's Exhibit DD-237, please. Just a uh, closer view. Yeah, more of a, a medium range photograph showing that same evidence. Now, how did you identify that area? As as far as the where the evidence was collected from, it's yeah. next to that outbuilding. Hey, did you break the uh, interior and the exterior uh, of the flying W in the two scenes then? Yes. Hey, I think you indicated that scene two was the outside, scene one the inside. Correct. Okay. Let's move on to State's Exhibit DD-238. And again, that's evidence item number one, and it's just showing a medium range photograph, just showing an overview of the items. Let's move on to State's Exhibit DD 239. And tell us specifically what we're looking at here at Tennis. Those are, uh, that's the same evidence item number one, um, and that's just showing that the, there's several cartridge cases were evidence item number one. We were looking at those other pictures. Were those uh, cartridge cases uh, marked by the little yellow flags? Yes. And in, uh, in this particular picture, DD 239, you gathered them up and set them by the uh, placard there? That's correct. They're all from that general area where we saw the flags. I'm going to hand you now what's marked as uh, State's Exhibit DD 595. Yes, it's an envelope, uh, it's fired cartridge cases, and it's got Flying W or 6851 Camp Creek Road. Uh, location next to building number one, it's got my name on it, May 13th, 2017. And did you yourself put any, uh, any stickers or anything on there? Yes, that evidence sticker. It says evidence number one, and that, that would have been placed on there by me. And if you would, Lieutenant, and you can use a set of gloves if you'd like to, uh, up to you. Would you open that up and show us what we're looking at?
told that there's uh, people who have to get out of carry on, but uh, what are we looking at here just for the record? That's, those are the cartridge cases that I collected as evidence item number one that you see in the photograph. What caliber are those? 22. Are they 22 longs, long rifles, magnums, or that, a variety? Looks like a variety. Looks like a variety. <coughs> They'll be consistent with some type of 22 ammunition. That's correct. You indicated uh, did you indicate the caliber of those rounds on the outside there? Yes, I did. Okay, so you check those and yes, uh, we're looking at every one every one of those as a uh, 22 magnum round. That's correct. Those are your photographs that I took on Flying W that day of the search warrant. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you pull up uh, State's Exhibit DD-274? Tell us what we're looking at there. That's a photograph of one of the buildings on the property, um, and that photograph is just showing an overview of that building and the fence gates. Let's move to State's Exhibit AD-276. Again, it's the same building. I'm just in front of the building now, taking a photograph of uh, that open gate there. Let's go to State's Exhibit DD 281 What are we looking at there? We've walked in the gate, that open gate that we saw in the, in the previous photograph, uh, and 
that's a photograph the I marked two items of evidence item number two and item number three inside that gate and we'll move in on those as in uh, picture two let's move on to state's exhibit dd 282 more of a overview more of a medium range photograph overview of evidence items two and three Let's move into state's exhibit uh, picture DD283. What are we looking at here, Lieutenant? That's an overview of evidence item number two, which is a cartridge case. Okay. And I'm going to well, no rule at this time, at least. I'm going to show you what's going to be marked as state's exhibit. Uh, DD five ninety six. Can you tell me what that is? That's an envelope. It's got evidence number two. Um, my name um, it says next to building number twelve, and it's a cartridge case, nine millimeter Luger, May thirteenth, two thousand seventeen. It's got my name on it. And Lieutenant, if you take those scissors and uh, what are we looking at here? That's a cartridge case, the nine millimeter luger that I collected that day as evidence item number two. Is that the same uh, nine millimeter casing that's depicted uh, in the picture above you? I know you've uh, marked as uh, your crime scene number two there. Yes, okay. that's correct. We we'll just replace that back in the office. On to state's exhibit uh, DD283. Has it given you that yet? Uh, yes. This is okay. I, I thought this. Move to uh, next one, DD284. Well, Lieutenant, if you just look at that really quickly, uh, is that the same cartridge you previously testified to just now? That's correct. Move on to State's Exhibit DD 285. What are we looking at there? That's evidence item number three, and that's a medium range photograph, just an overview of that evidence item, which is a cartridge case. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD 286, please? It's more of a close up photograph, and it's showing that evidence item number three, and it's a cartridge case. An envelope it says it's got an evidence label on it evidence number three and it's a fire cartridge case nine millimeter luger next to building number 12 may 13 2017 and it's got my name on it okay. and would you open that up That's uh, evidence item number three. That's the nine millimeter cartridge case. And is the nine millimeter case in your holding your hand the same as depicted in the picture above you? Yes, it is. Trade me. I'm going to have you look at the uh, state's exhibit 
DD597A. And tell me what that is, please. That's an envelope uh, that came from the laboratory. And it's got uh, laboratory marking on it as a uh, submission date of 5 15, 2017. And what was the purpose of sending that to the laboratory? It's marked as swabs. Hey, and did you have uh, State's Exhibit DD 597 swab for possible DNA as a blind swab? Yes, it did. This was sent to the uh, BCI Madison Laboratory? That's correct. And basically just had a couple questions. As the uh, Reed crime scene agent there at the scene at the Flying W Farms, did you take the uh, evidence gathered by other agents to BCI to the labs? Yes, we did. I, I did, yes. Your Honor, I have no further questions for Lieutenant White at this time. All right. I wonder if it would be a good time for us to take a, a break, a 15-minute break. It's uh, about 10, close to 10 till so. We'll be in break until 5 after 11. While the jury is on break, you're not to discuss this case among yourself or with anyone else on the communication to discuss with you or in your presence not to form or express an opinion concerning the case, uh, not to uh, do any research at all concerning the facts or the law of the case from any source at all, not to view, uh, listen to, or read any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all, and have no contact with any of the participants in the trial, including the parties, counsel, or witnesses. Uh, Council have anything before we break? We have nothing here. All right, we're going to break then until uh, 5 after 11. The jury will assemble at the jury room at that time.
when do you want to address it? <laughs> we, uh, when do you wish to address it? It doesn't matter to us. It just seems like, you know, I just had a chance to quickly review it. It seems like what the Court of, what the court of Appeals is saying is that there needs to be a hearing at some point. If we're going to. If there's going to be. Yeah. Uh, if the order is going to be modified or whatever. So I can do this for scheduling purposes. And obviously this just happened, so. We could do it. Uh, if you want to give the jury a little bit longer lunch hour, we could come in maybe a half hour before or something like that. That would work for That's fine with us. Okay. I will state on behalf of the state, there's no uh, particular pieces of evidence or anything like that that we would worry about uh, being out in the media. At least today, we're not doing any autopsy showing anything like blood or anything like that. So it's not an issue, at least this first day, and I read over that thing as quickly as I can. So I, I don't anticipate any issues today. Uh, yeah, Let me see. Is the uh, state uh, ready to resume uh, questioning? Actually, I believe it's the defense's turn. Oh, you, 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 uh, you were done with your direct? Yes. Thank you, direct. All right, cross examination. Good morning, Lieutenant. How are you? Good, how are you? Good to see you again. Same. Uh, a few questions, if I could. Yes. Uh, the photographs you reviewed with the jury just over the last hour or so, those are not all the photos you took up at Flying W, correct? That is correct. Um, and that would be a very large piece of real estate, right? Yes, very, uh, very large. I told you it's 2,000 acres or more. Would you agree with me on that? I was under the understanding it was right around 1,000. Okay. But a lot. Yes, a lot. And the area that you showed us photographs of, that's the main house, correct? Yes. And then various outbuildings and barns um, surrounding that immediate area around that. Yes, sir. Did you take photographs of any other areas of the property? Yes. Okay, but you have not shown those to us yet, correct? Correct. Right. And I, I believe it was somebody else that took photographs inside the home? Yes. Right? And... You touched on this, but you would agree that this is a working farm with livestock. Yes. Of various sorts, right? Yes. And the cartridges that uh, you showed photographs of, do you have any idea how long they were there? No, I, I do not. Right. And this, once again, was in May of 2017, correct? The search warrant, yes. When you took the photographs? Yeah, yeah, when I took the photographs. Sure. W would you agree that it's not unusual to find spent shell casings and cartridges on a large working farm. Yes, I would agree. Right. And you're certainly not saying those cartridge cases were related to various aggravated murders that took place more than a year before. I, no, I can't say that. Thank you, sir. I have no other questions. Yes, sir. Any uh, redirect? Just a couple of questions, Your Honor. But 
Lieutenant Hoy, you asked on cross-examination about the size of the Hawaiian W farm, approximately 2,000 acres or so, being an extremely big place. Yes. Would it ever be possible to search every single nook and cranny, field, uh, stream, tree, rock at that place? I would say no. It, it would not be possible to cover every inch of that property. So it would be possible that people could hide something there and you wouldn't be out in the middle of the field and able to see it? Correct. And you're also uh, asked a little bit about the shell case. This is a crime scene agent. Do you make the ultimate determination whether or not a piece of evidence is connected to a particular case or not? No, I collect the evidence and then it becomes part of the investigation wherever that takes it. Um, the evidence. If that particular item helps, fine. If it doesn't, that's fine too. It's my job to collect potential evidence. So you would normally, would your uh, normal procedure be to uh, give your information to the lab and the uh, investigatory agents such as Agent Shire on this? Yes, that's correct. No further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Right, you may step down. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Our next witness will be Special Agent Perry Razor of BCI. Swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth that you shall answer unto God. Yes. You may be seated. The state may examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Agent Rizzer. Good morning. Hey, would you state your name for the record and spell it, please? It's Al Perry Rizzer, P E R R Y R O E S E R. And what is your place of employment? The Bureau of Criminal Investigations. And what is your specific uh, assignment and duty with BCI? Right now I'm assigned to the Southwest uh, Special Investigations Unit for Ohio. How long have you been in the Special Investigations Unit? Uh, two and a half years. And what unit were you in prior to that? Uh, crime Scene Unit. And how long were you in Crime Scene? Uh, about seven years. And you just go over your law enforcement career here a little bit. How long have you been with BCI altogether? Uh, it's going to be 11 years. Uh, coming up. Hey, did, now, did you start out in crime scene when you went to BCI? Yes. Hey, where did you work before you went to BCI? Uh, the Clark County Sheriff's Office. Hey, what were your duties, ranks, and titles there? Uh, the last portion of my time at Clark County, I was in investigations for around seven years. Uh, be before investigations, I was uniform patrol, um, uh, started in the jail, so kind of worked your way up through everything and uh, left Clark County to go to BCI. And do you have any uh, advanced law enforcement certificates or attended any type of advanced training in your career? I have my master uh, investigation and uh, crime scene certificates through OPADA. I have certificates of uh, advanced blood school, shooting reconstruction stuff, um, an assortment of crime scene stuff. Uh, when I went to BCI with crime scene, it was labor intense with training, so there's quite a few certificates there. How many crime scenes would you say you've processed in your career, both with the uh, Clark County Sheriff's Office and BCI? Oh, I'd say hundreds. Okay. Hundreds. I, I can't put a number on it. Yeah, probably that, a lot. Yes. Obviously, more, yeah, more than 100, obviously. Yes. More than that. Okay. I'd like to direct your attention to uh, the... Uh, Road and mailing Gilly homicide case. Now, were you ever involved in the uh, initial search of the crime scenes on Union Hill Road at any time? Yes. Okay. Would that have been on or about April 22nd, 2016? Yes. And did you participate in other search warrants 
with your uh, fellow agents as well in this case. Yes. Was one of their search warrants the search of the Flying W Farm here in Pike County? Yes. And when did that take place? Uh, May 17th, 2017. If I said May 13th, 2017, would that ring a bell with you? Yes. Yeah, what was your role in the uh, execution of the search warrant? Um, my role was the main residence of the property, the, the, the home itself, uh, to document and collect evidence inside the house. Was the, uh, let me strike that. With the Flying W Farm, would you say that's a pretty large size piece of property? So, yes, it's a massive piece of property that's up a large driveway and had many barns and properties on on it did the search have to be broken up between a interior a house interior and then the exterior with the barns as well yes and who handled the exterior with the barns uh special agent brian White. and was he the person that previously testified here yes the your role was the interior of the Flying Debbie, can you tell me uh, approximately what time you would have gotten there that day, if you can recall, because again, it's been five years. Well, we were kind of on the property around 10 o'clock in the morning. And who all was with you? Were you assigned a partner or others to work with you? So there were a lot of people there. There were agents uh, assigned outside and inside, and uh, I'm not sure really what went on outside, but inside. Uh, I was assigned to the house, and there were a number of people inside the house also. So after I got in the house, I basically took some overall photos, and then each room of this house was labeled with a letter, A through, I think it went to N, and to document each room. And each room was assigned uh, personnel to search that room. So I, after I took overall pictures of the house and interior portions of the house, there are agents assigned to specific rooms to search these rooms. So that's how that, the search warrant was broke up inside the house. And can you describe the house for me? We'll show you some pictures later. It's a large farmhouse, uh, two-story, with a basement, uh, a large trophy room, large kitchen, bedrooms, just a big house. Were any of the residents of uh, the Flying Debbie Farm present that day for the search warrant? I believe so. Couldn't you recall who they were? I remember uh, <clears throat> one young lady that was running around the property. Uh, I think the mother was there. Uh, I don't know if the older, there was an older gentleman maybe there. Specifically, I remember two people. Okay. I'm going to have you take a look at that. Some pictures, obviously, if you several stacks, there's probably no way to go through it really, really fast. But I'm going to hand you a stack of pictures that will be marked for the record as States Exhibits DD 287, 290, DD 300, DD 302, DD 303, DD 308, DD 309. series of pictures. I'd like to go through those and see if you recognize those, and if so, let us know. If you yes. And who took those pictures? I believe I did. And when the uh, user crime scene agent take a picture, basically, uh, the pictures assign a uh, number from the camera plus your uh, three initials as well, aren't there? Yes. And are those on the, those on each of those pictures that you've taken? In? On the back side, they are. They're they're handwritten in. Yes. Okay. And do those pictures, that, the series of pictures I showed you, truly and accurately reflect the scene as you saw it that day? Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD 287? Special Agent Rizier, I'll have you take a look at that first picture, State's Exhibit DD 287. 
Tell us what that is. That's the front of the property of the home. I'd like to move on to State's Exhibit DD290. Be the next one. What are we looking at there? It's the back portion of the house. And move to DD300, please. And where on the house is that door located? It's on the exterior part of the house. It's a small little boiler room or furnace room. Was that the uh, door you used to make entrance to the house under search warrant? I don't believe so. Okay. Which door did you go in, if you can recall? I believe it was that back door off the deck. Off the back on the previous picture on 290. Okay. That's fine. Mr. Wilson, would you bring up State's Exhibit 302 for us? What are we looking at there? Um, this is uh, one of the bedrooms, I believe, inside the residence. Let's go on to State's Exhibit 303. And tell us what we're looking at there. Uh, another bedroom inside the residence. Move to State's Exhibit DD308. Tell us what we're looking at there. Uh, that's a close up of the previous picture of a nightstand uh, with belongings on the night nightstand. And is there anything, anything that drew your uh, interest laying there on that nightstand? A uh, handgun, a firearm. Again, Your Honor, I... Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the jury, evidence concerning guns uh, uh, allegedly recovered at the Flying W uh, farm as a result of a search conducted there on May 13, 2017, may not be considered by you as evidence of a bad character of the defendant or any member of his family, uh, or that uh, the defendant or any member of his family has a propensity uh, to commit crimes because of the uh, presence of uh, firearms recovered there uh, as a result of a search on May 13, 2017. Now, the state of Ohio has the burden of proving each and, uh, and every element of each of particular crime that's charged in this case beyond a reasonable doubt. That burden is not satisfied by an inference that the defendant has a propensity to commit crimes because firearms were allegedly recovered as a result of a search of the fly, at the Fly and W on May 13, uh, 2017. This evidence may not be used for that purpose, and you are so instructed. I will rule the objection from the prosecutor. And did you later take the uh, black crystal laying on that nightstand into uh, evidence and log it in? Yes. We'll get to that in a little bit. Mr. Wilson, would you move ahead to DD309? And what are we looking at there? Um, another firearm on the uh, bed of that mattress. And did you later uh, recover that item and log it into evidence? Yes. For the record, those are state's exhibits DD315, DD321, DD324, DD326, DD330, and DD332. Sir, do you recognize those? Yes. Did you take those? Yes. 
do they truly and actually depict the scene as you photographed it that day in May of 2017? Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD315? Special Agent Roser, would you tell us what we're looking at here? That's inside a, that's a safe inside a closet in one of the bedrooms. And did you eventually open that safe? Yes. Let's move to State's Exhibit DD321. What are we looking at here? This is uh, the living, living room area of the home. Let's move to State's Exhibit DD324. And what are we looking at there? Uh, same living room, it's just a different angle. And State's Exhibit DD326, please. And what does that depict? Uh, the kitchen area. Stacy Exhibit D330. And what does that show? Uh, looking the opposite direction of the kitchen area, same room. Let's move to State's Exhibit DD332 and tell us what we're looking at there. If you would, Mr. Woods? I um, believe that's the same room also, uh, just another angle. series of pictures if you tell me take a look at those and tell me if you recognize those pictures and for the record these pictures are states exhibits DD 335 DD 344 DD 346 DD 354 DD 356, DD 360, and DD 373. And sir, if you would, take a look at the uh, Stacy, actually, you reviewed those, back up a second. Do those truly and actually depict the uh, scene that day in May of 2017? Yes. For the record, did you yourself take this? Yes. Let's start with State's Exhibit DD 335, if you would, Mr. Wilson. Tell us what that is. Um, this is uh, part of the house. I think we call this the trophy room uh, with uh, a number of awards and ribbons and trophies associated, uh, I think, with horses. Well, it's part of this house. Look at State's Exhibit. DD 335, you mentioned the door off the back deck. Is that the uh, door to which you were referring, if you can recall? I, I can't recall okay. where that door goes. Be fair to say that's a pretty good size uh, house and a pretty good size piece of property? Yes. Let's move on to State's Exhibit DD 346 and tell us what we're looking at there. It's a bedroom. And move on to DD-354. And what does that depict? And that's a crawl space down to the basement. Let's move on to DD-356. And just tell us what that is. It's a photograph of the basement. DD 360. And what does that show? I think this is off the kitchen area, just a large refrigerator and uh, 
least through a couple doors to, to, to the outside there. Hey, Mr. Russell, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD-373? Is that the same safe you've uh, talked about in photograph before? Yes. Recognize those. <coughs> if you pull up uh, and tell us what we're looking at there, Special Agent Razor. Uh, that's an image of a handgun with a pla plastic placard uh, with a number one on it. Did you take that picture? Yes. And if we move to State's Exhibit DD-400. <laughs> and tell us what that is. That's uh, another image of item number one, a handgun with uh, the placard number one uh, indicating. It's sitting on a gun box, the firearm sitting on a gun box with the slide pulled back. And the bullet up top was actually pulled out of the chamber itself. Now, what area of the house was uh, that pistol found in? Uh, bedroom. That handy was marked as State's Exhibit DD-98. I'm handing that to you. You mentioned the term gun box. Is that what this is going to sound like a weird question? That's what this is? Yes. Like. And do you, that, at DCI, do you use special boxes to store handguns and firearms you collect as evidence? Yes, yes. Different boxes, different sizes for different guns. Okay. You open that up and there's gloves there if you want. Do you have a knife? Uh, I do not. Okay. Okay. Would you open up Space Exhibit 598 and tell us what that is? You get gloved up first. You seal those to prevent tampering and other things, do you not? Right, and on the front of the box is my integrity seal. Okay. That's my that's my initial. And it's marked 5, 13, or 17. Okay. And was that the date uh, that was packaged up? Yes. Did tell us what we're looking at there from this special uh, Inside the box, uh, there's an envelope here. It feels like there's a magazine in here. Do you want me to open this up? And you wouldn't have to. You wouldn't okay. Have. Those packaged up. Is the magazine in that envelope the magazine that's depicted in the picture? Yes. Magazine? Yes. Now, what make and model firearm is that? Uh, this is Caltech. Uh, the model is a PMR-30. I believe it's a 22 caliber firearm. Oh. And what's the 
look at you do with the fire. If you were just hold that up, obviously, point the safe direction. One thing, too, you actually have a uh, zip tie put through the barrel of that to ensure that there's no live ammunition in it, correct? Right. Just maybe hold that, hold that up for a little bit. See? Is that the same firearm depicted in the uh, photograph on the screen above you? Yes. Can you tell by looking at that? Was that ever sent to the lab? Um, if you can tell. Well, I can tell by the, the markings on, on the, the rail here. Those markings are from the lab. What's the purpose of those? Identification, case number for their, for their uh, reports. As a crime scene agent at the time, obviously, the forensic scientists at BCI would handle any analysis on that. Would they not? That's right. Yes. What was that exhibit number again? What was that exhibit number? Sure, Your Honor, that is State's Exhibit D598. that for me, please. You don't have to open that one up. Uh, this is this is evidence number 1.1. 1 .1. So this is after I collected, before I really handled that weapon, I did a standard blind swab to collect DNA from that firearm. And that's what that's what's in this package. It's a one swab uh, for DNA purposes. Okay. And with that, again, just for the record, tell us what the purpose of that blind swab is. You mentioned DNA. Uh, the swab, the reason for the DNA was to swab to possibly identify anybody that's handled that firearm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. exhibits DD412 at this time. I'm going to hand Mr. Wilson, what did the pictures I tell you for all? I'm sorry. Uh, again, being the numerically challenged person I am, would you please pull up GD403? And if you take a look at those three pictures, Special Agent Roser, and just tell us what those are. Uh, the first two images, the first image is a... a handgun laying on a bed. The second image would be a placard beside that uh, firearm. And the third image is going to be the firearm with the slide pulled back sitting on top of the gun box, just like the previous firearm. And those truly and actually depict the scenes you saw at that day. Yes. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up uh, State's Exhibit DD-404, please? Marked at State's Exhibit DD 600. It was in the previous boxed exhibit. I'll have to have you cut that open if you would. Okay.
And while you're opening that, where in the residence was that found? Uh, bedroom. Room A is uh, what's listed on my inventory sheet here. Tell us what we're looking at in that box, if you would. Specifically, Stacy Exhibit 600. It's a Glock firearm, Glock 17, Gen 4. It's a 9mm uh, with a serial number ABBL010. And what did you do with that when you recovered it? Uh, swap, uh, cleared it, swabbed it, and packaged it. Yeah. I'm going to hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit 601. Just tell me what that is. This is uh, marked evidence 1. Point, or 2.1. It's a blind swab of the spiral. And did you use the same procedure that you did on the prior exhibit? at the Teltec PMR-22? Yes. Was that sent to the lab? Uh, it looks like it was, yes. Time, I am going to have you look at state's exhibits DD 412, 414, and 416. And Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you pull up state's exhibit DD 412? Take a look at those two pictures and tell us what we're looking at here. image of a bedroom with a nightstand and what appears to be a gun case um, uh, at the bottom of the nightstand. The second one is four, 414 is the opened gun case with a firearm and the last image is a placard with number three with a uh, slide pulled back and the firearm unloaded. It's been identified as state exhibits DD 602 and DD 603, another evidence box, and another blind swap. Let me hand you the okay. evidence box first, DD 602. Open that up and show it to the jury and tell us what we're looking at. Inside um, this firearm box, it's marked evidence number three. It was uh, located in room A. That was the uh, bedroom you previously mentioned before, was it not? Yes. Uh, it's a firearm. It's a... Uh, MMP Smith and Wesson 22 caliber firearm. Uh, it's got some uh, some initials on the side with some numbers from the lab uh, attached to it. Uh, there's an envelope here. And I'm sure the magazine is in here. Special Agent Roser. Is the firearm you're currently holding in Stacy Exhibit that DD602 the same firearm as depicted in the picture above you? 
Yes. Did you ever take a long swab off of that firearm? Yes. And Andy was marked for State's Exhibit DD 6 or 3. Is that the blind swab that took off that firearm and sent to the lab? Yes, it's marked uh, 3.1 blind swab. States exhibits DD423 and DD424. Have you looked at those and tell me if you recognize those? Yes. is an image of a closet with a placard number four. It looks like there's two long rifles inside the closet. And 424 is one of those long rifles with a placard number four on the side of it. I'm going to hand you that. What has been marked as State's Exhibits DD605 and DD606. Tell us what uh, State's Exhibit 604 is, sir. Uh, this is item number four. It's a 22 caliber rifle. Uh, Any particular make and model? It's a Remington model 522 Viper with a scope on it. Okay, what caliber is it? 22 caliber. Thank you. Did you do a blind swallow with that as well? I'm sure yes. I'm going to hand you a smart to state's exhibit 86 and 5. Okay. Just tell me what that is. It's marked uh, with a BCI evidence marker as evidence 4.1 blind swab. And what did you do with that blind swab? Uh, swabbed it, packaged it, sealed it, and placed it. Uh, ultimately, ended up at BCI in London. room was State's Exhibit DD604, that Remington Viper that you have up on the uh, screen. What room was that in? It's in a closet. I have to look at my evidence sheet to uh, be specific what, what room that was uh, pulled from. Would it refresh your recollection to uh, take a look at your evidence sheet? Yes.
please raise your hand. It was marked as State's Exhibit DD. If you'd read through that and see if that refreshes your recollection in any manner. It does. What room did you find the uh, Birmingham 22 Viper uh, that was State's Exhibit DD604 in? Room A. And it was room A of the bedroom you previously yes. testified to. Space Exhibit DD40. DD what? 40? 440. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, 640. DD640, sorry, 440, my mistake. is an image of an assortment of long guns and 440 is an image of a long gun with a placard number 5. Mr. Wilson, would you go back to State's Exhibit uh, DD439? And what area of the house is that in? I believe this is also room A. Okay. The bedroom you previously described. This picture is true and accurately depict the scene yes. as you saw it. Yes. Did you yourself take those? Yes. State's Exhibit DD606. Tell us what we're looking at there, Special Agent It's a, um, this is a model CZ527 carbine. It's a 223 uh, rifle, bolt action. Yes, it's marked item number five. And do you ever have a uh, blind swap? Uh, yes. <clears throat> yes. Yeah, blind swap 5.1 is uh, my evidence sticker. And you follow the same procedure as in the other blind swaps you collected with the other firearms? Yes. And sent to the lab? Yes. CZ, and it would be uh, 
527 carbine. And the caliber is a 223? 223. Special Agent Razor going to hand you another long gun, State's Exhibit 608. If you'd open that up for us, it's going to be accompanying blind swab uh, marked as DD609. Tell us what we're looking at there, Special Agent Rosen. Um, it's marked item number six. It's a Winchester model 255 rifle lever action. It's a 22 caliber. And where in the residence was this found? Uh, it was found in the closet of that room A. The bedroom you previously testified to. Right. Does that operate a little bit different fashion than the other guns? Yeah, most, most uh, rifle, rifles we looked at was a bolt action. This is a lever action, uh, just a different mechanism to fire this firearm. Thank you. Put that back in the box. Okay. This is State's Exhibit 609. It's my evidence sticker 6.1. It's a blind swab of the rifle. And did you collect that blind swab in the same uh, manner and form and find the same procedures you did with the other firearms you previously testified to? Yes. will be DD-450 and DD-451. Mr. Wilson, you want to pull DD-450? Just see if you recognize those if you would, especially. an image of a long gun uh, sitting on sitting on top of a, a gun box that's flipped around and 
451 is the same image with a number seven placard with the magazine extracted out of the weapon. Mr. Williams, if you pull up uh, DD 451. I'm sorry. I'll be handing you state exhibits. This is a uh, bolt action Savage model 93. It's a 22 caliber firearm with a scope. And what did you do with that firearm uh, once you collected it? Uh, removed the magazine and then uh, swabbed it for DNA purposes. Was so that your standard procedure on each of the firearms you previously testified to? Yes. I'll have you take a look at the state's exhibit, DD-11 as well. And this is uh, marked 7.1, blind swab from this firearm. Was that collected in accordance with the uh, DCI standards and procedures and just in the same manner as you collected the other ones? Correct, yes. Mr. Wilson, you pull up uh, State's Exhibit DD-456. Special Agent Ruser will be handing you what's marked as State's Exhibits 456 and 457. If you'd identify those for us. Uh, these are long guns. Uh, 456 is a long gun sitting on a, a gun box, and 457 is the same uh, firearm with a number eight placard. Hey, what the make and model of firearm is that? Uh, Remington Wingmaster, model 870, I believe. I'm going to hand you a smart to Stacy. 613. Just open that up and tell us what we're looking at. Okay. Yes. 
it's a disassembled uh, shotgun. It's a uh, Remington Wingmaster 870 model. And is that the same item, again, most of the state's exhibit D612, that's up on the screen now that's previously testified to? Yes, this is a 12-gauge shotgun. It was found in the closet of Remy as well? Yes. So the Remington uh, 870 Wingmaster? 870 Wingmaster. And did you also take a blind swab on it for yep. uh, possible DNA, DNA comparison? Yes. Can I identify state's exhibit DD613 for me, please? This 8.1 blind swab from this firearm. And was that taken in accordance with BCI standard procedures in uh, the manner and form you previously testified to? Yes. Mr. Russell, will you pull up picture DD-460? Special Agent Razor, I'm handing you what's going to be marked as state's exhibits. 460 and 461. I'll ask you for five. If you took those, do they truly accurately represent the scene as you saw it on May 13, 2017? Yes. So what does Stace exhibit the picture DD-460 depict? It's a Glock firearm with the slide pulled back and the magazine extracted from the firearm. And where was it found? Uh, room A. This is a Glock Model 17 uh, with a serial number BBHF141. Hey, what caliber is it? Uh, nine millimeter. Did you indicate previously it's found in the room A? Yes. And is it the same item as depicted in the picture displayed on the screen right now? Yes. And did you take a blind swab on uh, this piece of evidence as you did with the others? Yes, I did. And what procedures, tell us again what procedures you used on that. Uh, before I packaged or handled the firearm, uh, we glove up and uh, use a product called SEB. It's a stain extraction buffer that we use to take blind swabs with. And was that sent to the lab? Yes. Wilson, could you 
pull up uh, State's Exhibit DD 467. pictures and marked the state's exhibits DD467 and DD468. Take a look at those and tell me if you recognize those and if so, who are they? Uh, 467 is an image of a handgun with a placard number 10 beside it and uh, 468 is an opposite angle of the handgun with a bullet extracted from the uh, barrel and the magazine extracted from the grip. Was that found in a loaded condition? Yes. CI evidence marker on it, mark number 10, firearm inside, it's a Beretta, 9mm, yes, it's uh, A10108. Seven two. Is it right? Seven Z. I'm sorry. Seven Z is the last numbers. Where on the uh, firearm is that located? It's on the bottom part of the rail, toward the uh, tip of the firearm. Mr. Wilson, could you zoom in on that, please? Okay. Your fingers at the front of that. Yeah. Yeah. Have you take a look at the state's exhibit CC 294 that was talked about by one of your co workers? Okay. Does that indicate a make and model and a serial number of a firearm? Uh, yes. What make model firearm does it indicate? The make is a Beretta, the model is 92FS, and the serial number is A. One zero one zero eight seven Z. Is that the same number contained on the exhibit sitting in front of you? Yes. And is there any particular name on there, if you can tell? Uh, customer signature looks like a George Ryder fourth. Mr. John, what is this we're talking about? This is the uh, real king receipt that one of the other witnesses talked about. And it is State's Exhibit CC294. Has he identified it? He was chosen. Um, you want me to identify it? No, uh, I wish the prosecutor to ask you. Yes, uh, just tell us what that is. Uh, this is a uh, firearm uh, purchase customer checklist. And it's, it was an envelope marked number five, uh, BCI evidence number five, states exhibit CC 27, 2016. And what signature does that date go with? You can tell. That looks like George Wagner IV as customer signature, and there's an associate signature, Heather 
Heather something. Brewer or something. With the yeah. same with the same day. Oh, so you yourself didn't collect that? No. You no. been assigned to a different part of the investigation. Um, yeah, I did not collect this. And does it indicate you did? Yeah, Ed Hunter, special agent Ed Hunter. And did you also do a blind swab of state's exhibit DD-616? Yes. Just tell us what that is. This is marked PCI evidence uh, number 10.1. It's a blind swab from the firearm. Hey, did you collect that swab in accordance with PCI's standard policies and in the manner and form you testified to previously on the other firearms? Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, pull up uh, State's Exhibits, State's Exhibit DD-467. And Special Agent Roser, that Beretta 92F with the grips you just testified to, where was that recovered in the residence? Room A. Same bedroom you previously testified to? Yes. Take a look at pictures DD 471 and 472 and 473. Okay. Oh, tell us what these are. Now, is that the gun that you just testified to? No. Tell us what those pictures represent. Um, this is uh, another handgun uh, marked uh, placard number 11. Uh, different shots, uh, angles on both firearm, and then uh, with the magazine extracted on DD 7, uh, 473. Marked as State's Exhibit 618-619. Would you open the box for State's Exhibit 618? This is marked evidence number 11 from BCI. It's a Beretta Model 92F semi-automatic semi pistol, 9mm. Yeah, hold that up. Okay. What type of grips does that have on it? I would call that uh, image the Grim Reaper. appear to be the same. That side and then this side. Yeah, same, same grips. Is there anything different about these? Uh, other than uh, what's out front here on the end of the barrel, that appears to be the only difference in the serial number. What is out in front of the end of that barrel? I don't know. I don't know what that is, to be honest with you. Okay. You know that. Uh, firearms examiner agent. No. Okay. 
those have the exact same grips on them? Well, they appear to be the exact same. CI evidence placard number 11.1 uh, .1, blind swab from this firearm. Yep. Did you take that and split the same standards and procedures as you did the other blind swabs from the other exhibits? Yes. heard many times this year while you're at your life says not to discuss the case among yourselves or with anyone else, not to permit the case to be discussed with you or in your presence, not to form or express an opinion concerning the case, to do no, uh, no research at all of any kind concerning the law or the facts of the case from any source at all. Do not read or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all, and that would include, of course, uh, Facebook, uh, other, other internet sources, social media sources, but would also include uh, newspapers, radio, and television. Avoid all of that. Uh, and have no contact with uh, any participants in the case, including parties, uh, counsel, or witnesses. Uh, does counsel for either side have anything further before we recess for our We have nothing further, Your Honor. Then we are at recess until 1.40. At that time, the jury will uh, assemble at the jury room.
seated. Is counsel for each side ready to have the jury draw that up? We're ready, Your Honor. Yes. may be seated. The state may uh, continue its direct examination of uh, Agent Rosie. Thank you, John. Hey, Special Agent Rosie, you're still on the roof. We'll continue. Where we were. Which we uh, marked as pictures that are states exhibits DD 477 and DD 478. Just look at those and see if you recognize them. Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you pull up uh, picture DD-477? You're ahead of me. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, over. And would you put up uh, DD-478, please? And what do those pictures depict, Special Agent Reserve? Uh, 477 is a handgun with a Marker placard indicating number 12, and 478 is the same firearm with the barrel extracted from the body with two cartridges uh, located inside the barrel. Well, I think it was marked as Station Exhibit 620, 621. By the way, with these pictures, are they true and accurate uh, copies of what you observed that day? Yes. Yeah, fine. So we got to get back to you. Here you go. I'm sorry. Mr. Chuck, this exhibit, I, I didn't hear what number you gave this. It's the, uh, the pictures were DD-477 and DD-478. The uh, Derringer itself is DD-620, and the swab with it will be DD-621. This is a 
9 millimeter Cobra model CB9 pistol. It's a Derringer style pistol with a hammer on it. The body separates from the barrel itself. It's a double barrel type of firearm. In your uh, training experience, the cases you've handled, are those that common? No, this is the first time I've seen something like this. I collected at a scene or anything. And is it the same item that you have depicted in, uh, as crime scene item 12 up there? Yes. And what did, what did you do with that item once you died? After I documented it, yeah, after I documented it, uh, I swabbed it for DNA purposes and then uh, broke it down and found the two cartridges. Okay. And when you did uh, take the blind swab, from it as uh, laid out in state's exhibit DD621, you would have followed all the BCI procedures just yes. as you did with the other exhibits? Yes. Thank you, sir. The hand group is marked as state's exhibits DD. 482 and 483. If you look at those and tell us what those are. 482 is an image of a long gun with a placard number 13 and DD 483 is the same image with the same placard 13 that has uh, been, the magazine's been extracted with uh, rounds laying beside it for a round count. Hey, where was that item on the uh, daring you previously testified to found? Well, that was in room A. Okay, room A being the bedroom you previously testified to. Yes. I'm going to hand you uh, State's Exhibit DD-622 and DD-623. Firearm and a blind swab of it. This one's a little bit heavier than the other ones. Uh, this is a rifle that has no uh, identifiers on it. Um, and my description uh, just says rifle with uh, a 303 with scope. So it's a long gun, bolt action. Uh, that's an older. It's an older firearm. Okay. I use the term. Uh, Infield or lead infield with you? Would uh, that ring about with the training experience? Yes. <clears throat> Basis of that's the same as that. I'm sorry. It's a leading question. Oh, it is leading. So I would sustain the leading question. Is that any particular uh, type of uh, rifle to your knowledge and your training and experience? No. Okay. Basically, you, you're not trained as a firearms examiner. No. Like that. Okay. But you have other people at BCI to do that job. And yes. You yes. Yep. And you would have. Yep. That be one of the reasons. I'm sorry. One of the reasons that you would have uh, taken that item and logged it in. Right. That's the the only reason why there's no there's no indicators on here for what a description, model number, serial serial number. I don't see anything on here. 
that I would have documented. Is he able to determine what caliber it was? Uh, firearms probably did, but I, I had not. And as in the rest of the firearms, did you take up the line of swab of it? Yes. I'll hand you a smart case. It's a DD 623. Yes, it's uh, my evidence tag 13.1 blind swab. Base exhibit DD four eighty five, which you right up, Mr. Wilson. Yes. Okay. Okay. Special Agent Rosier, I'm going to hand you what's marked as Stacy exhibits DD two sixty four and DD two sixty five. placard number 14. Hey, did you collect that particular item and package it in the box you have in front of you now? Yes. Be specifically Stace Exhibit DD 624? Yes. Hey, and once you have that open, if you would display that for the jury and tell us what type of firearm that is. This is a Thompson uh, 50 caliber uh, firearm um, muzzle loader. Uh, serial number is 67972, taken out of room A. And what did you do with that particular item? Uh, documented it, collected it, and swabbed it. Collect the swab will be marked as Stacy Exhibit DD 625. Yes. Was that prepared and packaged and processed in the same manner that you did with the rest of the swabs you previously testified to? Yes. And just briefly, we brought it up on the screen, but I'm just going to have you take a look at the physical uh, Stacy Exhibit DD 485. That's my image I took. And that's the True and accurate uh, depiction of the firearm that you're holding in that box right now. Yes. Same up on the screen. Yes. Thanks. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up uh, Stakes Exhibit DD 487? States Exhibit DD 487. Just take a quick look at that. Mm -hmm. And did you take that? Yes, I did. 
and I'm going to hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit DD 626. Open that for us, please, and tell us what we're looking at. If you would, sir, tell us what we're looking at there. <clears throat> it's another long gun. Um, it's marked evidence number, uh, BCI number, evidence 15. It's a, it's a rifle 303 British uh, with a magazine attached to it, M621. Uh, bolt action. And does that, uh, any of the engraving or markings on that particular firearm, show any manufacturer or caliber or anything like that? There's some old stamps on here. Um, Let me see. Yeah, they're hard to make out. Um, Be fair just, to say that item is maybe not of uh, the newest manufacturer? No, it's, it's an older firearm. that particular firearm? Uh, document, swap it for DNA purposes. And the swapping it for DNA purposes, I'll hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit DD 627. I'll really show it to you when you're working on putting that gun back. And do you recognize that? Yes, it's uh, evidence number 15.1. It's a blind swab of this firearm. Did you take that? Did you process it? Yes. And and would that have been done in the same with the same procedures as you testified to before in accordance with BCI's policies and procedures? Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, could you pull up State's Exhibit DD-497? several exhibits. First one being State's Exhibit 497. Tell us what we're looking at there. 497 is a uh, picture of a long gun uh, with a evidence placard numbered 17. And did you take that picture and does it truly and accurately represent the scene you saw the day you photographed it? Yes. I think you get another long gun. State's Exhibit number D-1. 
DD 630. I have you open that up and display it for the jury, please. This found in the residence. Room A. Uh, this is a Remington Wingmaster uh, 12 gauge shotgun, serial number S443656V. Uh, the model on it's an 870 Wingmaster 870. Was it also fold, uh, discovered in room A as you previously testified? Yes. here this evidence tag here and maybe just as a, a question of general interest um, we've always we've got you know, three tags on a lot of our pieces of evidence basically what does each one of them do well the one I can speak to is the middle one it's the evidence marker that I put on there we have a, a mobile uh, printer that prints out these tags with a description with an evidence number description, date, time, who collected it, where it was collected from. The other markers are, uh, this may be evidence receiving when uh, when it gets checked into BCI in London, and I'm not sure who puts this tag on up top. Obviously more than, more people than you see this right. on down the line. So you have the capability to print, print out evidence labels right at the scene, pretty much anywhere. Yeah, we have, uh, at the time we had iPads and mobile printers and input everything right into the iPad and that prints out to a, a mobile uh, a printer that fires out those uh, stickers. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD-498, please? Yes, it does. And did you take that? Uh, yes, I did. Does it truly and accurately reflect the scene and item number 18 as you saw it that day? Yes.
Tell us what we're looking at there. This is another uh, long gun. This is a Browning uh, Model A bolt action uh, rifle, 22 caliber, uh, with a tripod on the end of it with a scope. Is that the same weapon that's uh, displayed in Stace Exhibit DD-498, the picture that you've identified that's on display of you? Yes. Okay. And what did you do with that item once you've uh, Mr. taken Ken, it what in? Is, excuse me, what is this exhibit? This exhibit is, uh, give me one second, I just had it, Your Honor. DD-632. That's it, DD-632. And did you take a blind swab of that particular item? Yes. And is that um, is that a swab listed as DD six thirty three and setting before you now? Yes, it is marked uh, eighteen point one. And what did you do with State's Exhibit DD six thirty three? Uh, after I swabbed it, packaged it. Uh, put my integrity seal on the back with the date and uh, submitted everything up to BCI to temporary order. Okay. Is there a, uh, double check something, is there a caliber marking on the outside of that? Listed, it's a 22 on my tag. It says it's an A bolt caliber 270 uh, WSM only. You don't see not a 22, but you've seen enough of these thing like that these days. Yeah, yeah. I think I went with a 22. It says 270, but I put 22 on my uh, on my tag number. Was that was that hard to get the number off there? Yes, it, it's very hard to read uh, still today. We were able to get a serial number as well. Yeah, serial number is good. Okay, you have the same serial number in your paperwork. And the box and everything else is all on that particular weapon. Then. Yes. Mr. Wilson, would you bring up State's Exhibit DD-503? I'm going to hand you several exhibits, Special Agent Rosier, that will be Picture DD-503, State's Exhibit DD-634, which will be a gun on a long box, and then a blind swab listed as DD-635. that picture. And if you do, would you tell us what it is and if you took it? Yes, it's one of my images. Uh, it's a picture of another long gun with a placard 19 beside it. I'm going to hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit DD 634. 
have you open that and take a look for us, please. for the members of the jury to get that out here. And tell us what we're looking at, please. It's another long gun, uh, bolt action uh, style. It's got markings on it. Uh, full 452 Scout, uh, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, made in the Czech Republic. Uh, serial numbers uh, 5 seven five three four zero six does it indicate a caliber on that anywhere 22 is that the same item as depicted in state's exhibit uh, uh, dd stuff right the uh, 503 the picture on the screen of it yes and is it truly and accurately yes true and accurate and as with the other, uh, we've got 18 firearms we've looked at. Did you perform any type of a blind swab on State's Exhibit uh, DD-634? Yes, it's marked as uh, BCI evidence 19.1. Uh, and did you follow the same uh, conditions and procedures that you previously testified to on yes. the other 18 firearms? Yes. Another series of exhibits starting with State's Exhibit DD 504. And just tell us what that is if you took it. Yes, this is my image. Uh, it's another long gun, image of a long gun marked with uh, 20, placard 20. And hey, would you open up the uh, box that's been identified as State's Exhibit uh, DD-636. This is a KSA model cricket, 22 caliber firearm with serial number 328233. What caliber is that for the record? 22. Okay. Is that the same uh, firearm that's depicted in State's Exhibit uh, DD 504, the picture on the screen above you in front of you? Yes, it is. And what did you do with that item once you uh, collected it as evidence? Uh, swabbed it for uh, DNA purposes, packaged it, and, uh, packaged the firearm. I'd like to direct your attention to State's Exhibit DD-637 on the uh, 
in there in front of you. Mm -hmm. Just identify what says, that uh, is. Yeah, BCI evidence tag 20.1. Uh, this is the blind swab I uh, took from the firearm. And you process that in accordance with the same uh, procedures you previously testified to on the other firearm, sir? Yes. Picture, another swallow, up, and another long gun for you, Special Agent Razor. Let me start by identifying State's Exhibit GD508 there, if you would. 508 is another image of a long gun uh, with a pink stock uh, with a BCI placard number 21. Yeah. Would you uh, go ahead and open that box for us, please, in State's Exhibit? DD-638, if you would. I do, and it is State's Exhibit DD-508. My apologies. what we're looking at there, sir. <clears throat> it's a KSA uh, models a cricket 22 caliber rifle with serial number 632042. And is it the same item that's depicted in the, the picture on the screen, which is listed as State's Exhibit DD508? Yes. you do a blind swab on that uh, pink cricket rifle you previously testified to? Yes, I did. It's uh, marked BCI evidence 21.1 uh, blind swab. And was that done with the same uh, procedures you previously testified? Yes. Mr. Wilson, would you bring up State's Exhibit DD-511, please? Special Agent Razor, I'm going to hand you State's Exhibit 511. Can you identify that for us and tell us what that is? Uh, 511 is another image of a long gun with a BCA placard number 22. Hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit 640. Open that up for us, please, and then display it for the jurors.
Can you tell us what we're looking at there, sir? Uh, this is a Remington model 510 Target Master, bolt action, 22 caliber, serial number is RM49. And is it the same item that's that depicted in the uh, picture above at DD511? Yes. And what did you do with that Target Master identified space exhibit DD640 once you did that? Collected After documentation, I swabbed it for DNA purposes. And take a look in front of you there. Do you see state's exhibit uh, GD641? Yes. And just tell us what that is, please. Uh, it's marked BCI evidence number 22.1 blind swab. And was that collected and dealt with under the same conditions and procedures you previously? Talked yep. about on the other uh, 21 firearms? Yes. And where were the, uh, the target master on the two cricket uh, firearms found in the residence? Room A. previously testified to you before? Yes. Last firearm of your testimony. Can you put some more for state specific DG 628? Hold off on this particular exhibit for now and maybe have another witness. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up Stace Exhibit DD 516? State's Exhibit DD-516. Tell us what we're looking at there. It's a BCI evidence marker 23. It is an image of a, a cluttered area with miscellaneous items. Hey, did you take any of those items uh, and collect them for evidence purposes? I believe we took the uh, shipping notification form. And he was marked to State's Exhibit DD-642. You must have to go all the way through it. But uh, just tell us what that is. Well, it's an order uh, confirmation from OpticPlanet.com. It was shipped to Frederica Wagner, billed to 
Frederica, Frederica Wagner on Camp Creek Drive, a description. You want me to go through all this? Yeah. No, okay. Basically, when you're doing a search warrant such as this, who will be your purpose for taking those documents? Uh, for evidential purposes. Uh, if we believe it could uh, uh, lead to something else, then we'll grab it. Would those, would those items, such as you have in your hands now, be passed on to analysts and other agents at BCI for them to review and take a look at? Typically, go to our criminal intelligence unit. Okay. And, you, and if you know on this, was, did that happen with this, or can you tell by the... Uh, I can't tell by the markings on this. Okay. Uh, but it was collected and uh, uh, taken to London. Okay. We'll just get the first back in. Mr. Wilson, you can pull up State's Exhibit DD 541, please. Special Agent Ruger, I'll have you take a look at that. Tell us what that represents. What are we looking at there in that picture? Um, 541 is an image of a BCI placard number 24. It's uh, sitting on top of uh, notepads. On a desk. Those yes. Evidence. Okay. Similar to what you testified before was the uh, office plan of documentation. Yes. Well, those typically be sent on to other agents or animals. Yes. There's four of them in here. Yeah, there's the same items again in the uh, picture above you. Yes. Mark to State's Exhibit 546. Can you put that up, Mr. Wilson? And just tell us what we're looking at there. This is a uh, marker BCI 25. It's a bank statement. And what would have been your purpose in collecting that? Uh, more evidence for uh, our analysts to look at. I'm going to hand you what's marked as State's Exhibit DD644. If you would identify that for us, please. And does that picture truly and accurately represent what you uh, saw of the residents of the flying that day? Yes. Same document that's depicted in the picture above you. Yes, it is. And they should collect it for uh, to be sent to the analyst down the road. Yes. As a crime scene agent, do you frequently make determinations about documents and their evidentiary value and those type of things at the scene, or is that often passed to the analysts and other agents? How does that work? Um, it's uh, a little of both. It's uh, 
kind of at the scene, we're discussing different things, and if it's questionable, usually we take take it all, and if it's not needed, it's not needed, but if uh, we think it's of use, we'll grab it. Okay. Would the size of the case or the area to be searched uh, have any bearing on those decisions? No. Okay. And where in the uh, residence did you find those documents? Um, I'd have to look at that evidence sheet again to be specific on that one. Okay. I'm going to hand you uh, State's Exhibit DD again. Mm -hmm. you care to refresh your recollection? Room J. Hey, what was room J? Uh, I'd have to look at my photos, but I believe that was another bedroom. I'm going to hand you... Two more pictures here. Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD five fifty seven, please? Special Agent Rosa, would you tell us what those two pictures represent? Uh, 557 and 558 are the same picture. 558 has a placard on mark number 26. Uh, 557 is uh, a swab next to a stain. So we can field test uh, blood stains if they're positive or negative in the field, a presumptive blood test and if it's negative we disregard it but if it's positive we have a test in the field we use TMB tetramethabazidine and uh, once the chemical is applied to a stain uh, you wait about 15 seconds and if it turns that aqua color it's positive for blood hey, did you do that in this uh, in regards to the item Soon on the screen here. Yes. I'm going to hand you that item being State's Exhibit DD 645. If you open that up, those pictures pretty accurately represent what you uh, found in the residence that day. Yes. And where in the residence, if you recall, was the uh, that coat found? Room D. How what room D was? I, went, I, I, want, I don't want to guess, so. But obviously it's been uh, approximately five years and a few months since you've been out there. Yes. Do a swab on uh, State's Exhibit DD 646. Take a swab from it. I'll hand you what's marked the exhibit that's 645. This is State's Exhibit 646. Yeah, so for this one, this one's a little different. So on this one here, uh, we swabbed it, swabbed it. For suspected blood on item 26. So this is 26.1, this is 26, and uh, that was swapped for blood. And was that, uh, was a field test done on it, or did you just have it sent directly to the lab? Oh, I did a field test on it. Okay. Can you recall what that was? Positive. And what did you do after that? Then I grabbed another sterile swab, moistened it, and uh, packaged it for the lab. Yeah, and that's what space exhibit DD-646 would be with the lab yes. number on it. Yes. And does not BCI standard procedures say you do a uh, test on a 
the swab and a test on a piece of clothing, you get a positive. At that point, is it sent to the lab? Yes. It's just a presumptive test in the field, and they do a confirmatory test at the okay. lab. And obviously with the presumptive test, the, that's not 100%, is it? No. That would be why it's sent on to the lab, would it not? Right. Mr. Wilson, would you bring up Stacey Exhibit DD-552? Okay. Special Agent Ridge, I'm going to hand you what is marked as Stacey Exhibit's Cushy Council. Okay. I will hand you those.
Mr. Wilson, would you pull up State's Exhibit D-566? Pictures mark state's exhibits DD566 and DD568. Would you tell us what these are? <coughs> uh, 566 is an image of uh, tactical leg holsters for pistols. And if you know, does it fit any particular type of pistol? It could fit numerous pistols. Okay. Again, council approach.
Mr. Rosen, would you pull up State's Exhibit DD-577, please? Special Agent Bruiser, I'm going to hand you a smart note at State's Exhibit DD-577. Tell us what we're looking at in that picture. It's a spiral notebook uh, with a placard number 31. Hey, is that a true and accurate copy? Yes. I'm going to hand you a smart to State's Exhibit DD-651. You don't really have to open that, but uh, does that contain the notebook that's depicted in State's Exhibit DD-577? Yes. And what was your purpose? Sorry, the The DD-651. And what was your purpose in collecting that, that particular notebook? It could contain uh, evidentiary value information. And was it passed on to the analysts or the intelligence people? It was submitted to BCI, and I'm, I'm assuming it was. <laughs> and Mr. Wilson, would you pull up Stacy Exhibit? DD-591. And what are we looking at in State's Exhibit DD-591? Uh, BCI Evidence Marker 32. There's a, uh, it's in a laundry basket with uh, a balled up, uh, piece of tape next to an uh, uh, empty magazine. Special Agent Richard, what was your specific uh, reason for collecting uh, item 32 in a State's Exhibit DD-652 that we would have all tape? Well, it looked like uh, what many of us thought was could be used as a makeshift silencer for a weapon. Hey, would you open up that bag, please? You don't have to open it up if you got the picture on there. Yeah, that's a pain trying to get through there. So just have you by that. So that's, is that the uh, bullet up roll of tape that's depicted in that picture? Yes. Mr. Wilson, if you would, would you show us Stace Exhibit DD594? Tell us what that picture is. It's just a different angle of what we collected out of that laundry basket of uh, item 32. And was your intent on uh, taking that piece of evidence to send it on to firearms or the analyst? Yes. Special Agent Razor, just for the record, the pictures you testified to today, did you take all of those? Yes. Do they truly and accurately depict the uh, scene at the Flying W as you saw it on May 13th of 2017? Yes. Your Honor, I have no further questions for Special Agent? Pardon me? Back up just a second. Recall what uh, that rolled up ball of tape you took uh, that uh, was on suspicion of being some type of suppressor. Uh, what room in the residence was that found in? 
Uh, D, room D. Okay, call where room D was. Not without looking at further photos. No further questions. The defense will be cross examined. Great, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for coming in. Uh, my name is John Parker. I'm one of the attorneys for Mr. Wagner. Just a few follow-up questions, if I can. Uh, you took all the interior photos of this residence, right? Yes. Do you know how many rooms were in that residence, approximately? Uh, nine, ten, ten, maybe eleven. Okay. Um, do you know how many people were living there? How many people were living there? Yes. No, I don't. Right. Now, you testified as to rooms A, J, and D. Is that correct? If that's what I said, yes. Okay. So those are the three bedrooms where you took various photographs that you described today. Is that right? Right. Do you know whose room is room A? No. Do you know whose room is room J? No. Do you know whose room is room D? No. Right. Was there an elderly man living there at the time? I believe so. Very ill, bedridden? Uh, from what I remember, yes. All right. Was his room A, J, or D? I think his room was in, off the kitchen. There was a bed like off the kitchen. I think that's where his, that's, right. I, I'm uh, just based on some of the things I saw near the bed. Okay, so I, I guess what I'm asking is, these are three bedrooms, A, J, and D, correct? Yes. All right. They appeared to belong to three different people. I don't know about that. All right. Were they, were they all on the first floor of the house? All that evidence was gathered from the first floor, I believe. All right. Did you gather anything from the second floor? I do not believe so. Or the basement? I do not believe so. All right. So it's these three rooms on the first floor, A, J, and D. I believe so. There was one that uh, you showed some photos that kind of had some miscellaneous papers. One of the last photos looked like it was on a desk. Yes. All right. Did that appear to be an office of some sort? There was an office area, uh, a desk, office, computer, I believe. Um, with respect to some firearms, you purchased, I'm sorry, rephrase that. You testified about a gun that was purchased, and you saw, and you had the receipt from World King. I believe it was a 9 millimeter. Do you remember that? The Beretta. The Beretta, yes. You remember that? Yes. All right, and then you showed some photos of it, correct? Yes. All right, and in those photos, there were what I would call aftermarket grips on it with the Grim Reaper, is that right? Right. All right, those Grim Reaper grips are not part of the gun when you buy it, is that? Uh, typically, no. All right. That's something if somebody wanted to dress it up in some way. Yes. They could buy it afterwards. Right. But it's not part of the original purchase. I would I agree with that statement. And do you know who that gun belonged to at the house? No. You're not suggesting, are you, that any of these guns you've testified about, you're not suggesting that any of these were used in the murders back in April of 2016, are you? No. They're unrelated to the actual murders themselves? I don't know that. You don't know one way or the other? I don't. Okay. You just collected these items? Yes. All right. Somebody else can say whatever they want. You just collected these items? That's right. Does the state wish to redirect? Yes, Your Honor, if I could have a chance. 
How do you determine who's where and those type of things? Or are you just there to collect evidence and turn it over to the other investigators? I mean, every case is different. Uh, this case was um, more of search, find, collect. So then your role would be more to assist the uh, SIU agents assigned to this case, such as Agent Scheider. Sure. You were asked about the uh, optic plant paperwork from State's Exhibit D642. Have you looked through that again? I've got eight pages marked D642 A1 and A2, D642 D1, D2, and D3, and State's Exhibit uh, DD642 C. Take a look at the DD642 A1 first. Does that uh, cover any particular items or anything like that on there? If you can check that. Uh, the description on this purchase is Grim Reaper bust and body for uh, $53. And what's the date on that? Uh, Paperwork uh, order date is December 22nd, 2016. It references uh, a polymer Grim Reaper uh, grip as well on this statement. And what's the uh, date on that statement if it shows? November 29th, 2016. So far we've done DD642 A1, B2, B1, B2, B3, right? Yes. Yes. Sir, showing you a DD-642, the items you just looked at, if you look through there, is there a name of a purchaser of those items or someone who ordered those items? Um, ship to uh, name. Okay. And it was uh, Frederica Wagner at 6851 Camp Creek Road, Lucasville, Ohio. Thank you, sir. I have no other questions. You can just put those items, put those pages back in. Thank you. No, no other any, questions. Right. Any further questions for the state? Your Honor, we have no further questions, especially with the reserve you Thank you. Please step down.
uh, not do any research at all concerning the case, either as to the facts or as to the law from any source at all. Do not read, uh, view, or listen to any reports or accounts of the case from any source at all, and have no contact with any of the participants in the case, including parties, counsel, or witnesses. So, uh, does counsel for either side have anything further before we recess until 325? No, thank you. We don't have All right, we are in recess until 325 at that time. Jurors, the jurors are to assemble at the jury room.
Council. Both sides ready to uh, have the jury vote. Yes, Considering all the arguments in favor of admitting the firearms and excluding the fire and the arguments against admitting them, and, uh, and then the uh, defense motion for new trial is overruled and uh, We are ready for the jury. May be seated. The uh, state may call this next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. State will recall Matt White. To, to the jury, but for the record, could you at least give us your name, please? My name is Matthew White. Your Honor, before I begin questioning this witness, I ask the defense to, again, engage in stipulation that this witness is an expert with respect to firearm examination and tool mark. Okay. All right. All right. So on stipulation, uh, the court will grant that to the defense. The uh, witness will be recognized as an expert to firearms and able to testify as an expert with respect to firearms. Thank you, Your Honor. A couple weeks ago, did you come in here and testify about your initial work in this case? 
Yes, sir, I did. And then last week, uh, did we bring you back to talk about comparisons you did with respect to a search warrant at 260 Peterson and evidence that was recovered from the murder scene? Yes, sir, that's correct. And through testimony in both of those cases, did you give uh, your opinion with respect to various comparisons you made in this case? Yes, I did. And again, were those opinions to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? They were. I want to do this kind of quickly. We have to do it again for the record. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. That states exhibits B19, B20, B21, B excuse me, B319, B320, B321, B328, and B329. Can you take a look at those? Tell us what those are and uh, where they're from. These particular items correspond to the five fired 22 long rifle cartridge cases recovered from scene two. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It states exhibit C430. Can you take a look at that? Can you tell the jury again what that is? This particular item is one 22, uh, fire 22 long rifle cartridge case from scene three. With respect to your initial work in this case, did you do comparisons of these 22 casings from uh, scenes two and scenes three? I did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as states exhibit 7.1 and 7.8. States exhibits AA116 and states exhibit AA116A. Can you take a look at those and can you tell the jury what those are? These particular items are two fired 22 long rifle cartridge cases recovered from 260 Peterson. And more specifically, are those two casings that were recovered as a result of the May 10th, 2017 search warrant? Yes, that's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as states exhibits BB266, BB279, BB-294, BB-333, and BB-335. Can you take a look at those for us? Can you tell the jury, do you recognize those? And if you do, can you tell the jury what those are? I do recognize these items. These items correspond to 10 fired 22 long rifle cartridge cases, also recovered at 260 Peterson. And again, with respect to all of those exhibits that I just had you identify, um, every, one of, every one of these 22 caliber uh, cartridge casings, again, did you compare those all to each other? Yes, sir, I did. And did you reach an opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty as to whether or not those were all fired from the same gun? I did. And did you testify to that opinion last week? I did. And what was it? I was able to conclude that all of the fire 22 long rifle cartridge cases from scenes two and three, as well as the fired cartridge cases from 260 Peterson, had all been fired in the same firearm. You also testified early on, actually probably in both your testimony, that as part of your work in this case, you did some research to try to determine specifically what kind of gun or what kind of 22 may have fired those shell cases. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. And was that research pretty extensive? It was. Okay. Uh, and again, did you testify or is it your testimony that as part of that research, you actually even reached out to the Walther company in Germany? Yes, that's correct. Now, I want to clarify something. When you did your comparisons or you received the evidence from 260 Peterson. At that time, in May of 2017, had you done that extended research to determine whether or not uh, that was a Walther fire? No, at that time I had not performed that research. Uh, was it, again, later on that you were able to determine that? Yes, it was. And when was it that you were able to, again, get that initial information from the other lab and then reach out uh, to the, the Walther company? I believe that was in 
July of 2017. Now, at some point, as part of your work in this case, uh, did you learn that a search warrant had been conducted at the Flying W Farms and that firearms had been taken into evidence as part of that search warrant? Yes, I did. And at that time, again, May of 2017, specifically May 13th of 2017, again, did you specifically know what type of 22 you were looking for? I did not. As a result, did you have to go through and examine the 22s that had been collected from the Flying W Farms to see whether or not you could include or exclude any of those 22 caliber uh, weapons? Yes, that's correct. And did you, in fact, do that? I did. Can you tell us how you did that? So when the 22s from the Flying W were submitted to the lab, tell the jury your process for going through and trying to determine whether or not that specific firearm is either included or excluded as having fired these shell casings you already identified? When the firearms are submitted to the laboratory, I'll fill out a worksheet detailing specifications about the firearm, and then I will test fire the firearm into, we have a water recovery tank that has a net on the end of it, so I'll actually test fire the firearm itself, and there's a net on the outside of the tank that collects the fired cartridge cases, and the shooting into the water, that allows me to collect uh, test fired bullets as well. Those known test-fired cartridge cases that I took with the submitted firearms, I can later microscopically compare to the evidence in an attempt to say whether or not they've been fired in or from a particular firearm. And did you do that with the weapons that were submitted from the Flying W, specifically the 22s that were submitted from the Flying W search warrant? Yes, I did. My handy what's been marked for identification purposes is State's Exhibit DD-598. Can you take a look at State's Exhibit DD-598 for us? Can you tell the jury, do you recognize the markings on that packaging from State's Exhibit DD-598? I do. I can identify the blue laboratory label uh, indicating the laboratory number as well as the item number. And as part of your work in this case, did you compare test fires from that exhibit to shell casings that were recovered uh, from the scene and from the prior search warrants of uh, 260 Peterson. Yes, that's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit KK1. And Mr. Junk, if you could put State's Exhibit KK1 up on the screen for me. Mr. White, do you recognize uh, what State's Exhibit KK1 is? I do. And could you tell the jury, first of all, is this a, a product or a work product of the comparison that you did with respect to that exhibit and uh, collected shell casings in this, this case? Yes, this is a picture detailing the microscopic comparison that was taken uh, from the fired cartridge case of the Caltech PMR-30 pistol compared to a fired cartridge case from scene two. And can you tell with respect to KK1, can you point out to the jury what they're looking at and whether or not that truly and accurately depicts the comparison you did in this case? Again, you'll notice the dividing line between the items. The known test fire taken with the Caltech PMR-30 pistol is on the left side. The fire 22 long rifle cartridge case uh, from scene two is on the right side. We're looking at the firing pin impression that is present. This is the firing pin impression that was present on the evidence uh, fired cartridge cases from scenes two and three. Again, you'll notice the unique shape as well as not going off the edge of the rim. This is the firing pin impression of the Caltech uh, PMR-30. You can see that the firing pin impression is substantially different than the firing pin impression on the fired cartridge case from scenes two and three, as well as 260 Peterson. So therefore, I'm able to eliminate that particular firearm as having fired those cartridge cases. Okay. And that elimination opinion, or your opinion as to whether or not uh, that Caltech uh, was a contributor to those shell casings, was that to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, it is. So as you sit there today, based on the work that you did in this case, can you tell this jury to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty that this pistol right here, State's Exhibit DD-598, was not used in the homicide in this case. That is correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked 
for identification purposes, it states exhibit DD602. States exhibit DD602. Do you recognize the markings on that item? I do. Can you tell the jury what that is, please? Again, I can identify the blue label placed onto the packaging with the laboratory number and the item number of the firearm. And did you, well, first of all, tell us what that item is. Uh, this particular item is a Walther Smith & Wesson uh, model M&P uh, P22 pistol. And as part of your work in that, this case, did you compare that exhibit or that pistol right there with shell casings that were recovered from both the scene and the search warrants of 260 Peters? I did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, the state's exhibit KK2. And Mr. Jones, can you give us KK2 on the screen? Do you recognize State's Exhibit KK2? I do. Can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to this exhibit? You're looking at a microscopic comparison of the test-fired cartridge case taken from the Walther Smith & Wesson model M&P 22 pistol. On the left side, on the right side, again, is the evidence uh, fired 22 long rifle cartridge case. You're looking at the firing pin impression. You'll notice the firing pin impression is substantially different from the evidence. But also of note, this fired firing pin impression did not extend off the edge of the rim, similar to that. However, the shape of the firing pin impression was completely different. This firearm was a Walther uh, Smith & Wesson, meaning it was a trademark name they used, Smith & Wesson, but Walther was the manufacturer. So this was also uh, part of my research that this, again, was unusual, that it did not extend off the end of the fine pin impression, which made me think it's possible it could be another Walther firearm. Okay. And to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, were you able to exclude that Smith & Wesson model M&P pistol as having been the gun that fired uh, the shell casings found at the scene and at 260 Peterson. Yes, based off the firing pin impression, the difference in the shape of the firing pin impression, I'm able to exclude this firearm as having fired the fired cartridge cases left at the scenes. My handy was been marked for identification purposes. It states exhibit DD638. It states exhibit DD638. Do you recognize the markings on that item? I do. And can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to that exhibit? This particular exhibit is a KSA model cricket uh, rifle. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes. It states exhibit KK3. Mr. Junk, can I get KK3 on the screen? <coughs> Can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit KK3? This particular example is the microscopic comparison of the test fires taken with the cemented rifle compared again to the evidence cartridge cases. You'll notice the fine pin impression on the evidence rifle is circular in shape versus the evidence fired cartridge case. Uh, based off that substantial difference in the shape of the fine pin impression, I'm able to exclude that firearm. And is that exclusion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? It is. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes at State's Exhibit DD634. State's Exhibit DD-634, do you recognize the markings on that item? Yes, sir, I do. Again, blue laboratory sticker on the end of the box indicating the case number, item number, firearm. Can you tell us what kind of firearm that is? This is a CZ model 452 uh, rifle, 22 long rifle. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes is State's Exhibit KK-4. Mr. Junk, can I get KK-4? Well, State Exhibit KK4, well, first of all, the, the rifle, the exhibit that you have in your hand, uh, State's Exhibit 634, did you compare that to the shell casings collected from the scenes 
and from the search of 260 Peterson. Yes, I did. And with respect to Stacey's exhibit KK4, can you tell the jury what they're looking at with, in that exhibit? On the left side of the photograph are the test fired cartridge cases taken with the CZ model 452 rifle. And again, on the right side is one of the evidence fired 22 long rifle cartridge cases. You'll notice the firing pin impression on the rifle versus the firing pin impression of the evidence cartridge cases is substantially different. That allowed me to exclude the rifle as having fired the cartridge cases. And again, was that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, it is. My handy was been marked for identification purposes. This state's exhibit DD640. Exhibit DD640. Do you recognize the markings on that item? Yes, sir, I do. And can you tell the jury what that is? Again, I can identify it by the laboratory sticker on the end of the box. This corresponds to a Remington Model 510 Target Master rifle. Been a handy one. Been marked for identification purposes. That state's exhibit KK5. State's Exhibit KK5, can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit KK5? This is a microscopic comparison of test fires taken with the Remington Model 510X Target Master Rifle. Again, microscopically compared to the fire cartridge case left at the scene. Notice the firing pin impression, again, is substantially different in the shape of the firing pin impression allowing me to be able to exclude the Remington rifle as having fired the 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. And is that exclusion or that opinion on that exclusion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, it is. The handy what's been marked for identification purposes is DD636. Do you recognize the markings on that item? Yes, sir, I do. Can you tell the jury what that is? This particular item is another KSA model cricket rifle. And again, did you compare test fires from that exhibit to shell casings collected at the scene? I did. My handy what's been marked for identification purposes is State's Exhibit KK6. State's Exhibit KK6. Mr. Jeff, can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit KK6? They're looking at another microscopic comparison. This the left side are test fires from the KSA model cricket rifle. On the right side is the fired 22 long rifle cartridge case from the scene. Again, the test fired cartridge case firing pin impression is circular and completely different than the firing pin impression present at the scene. That allowed me to be able to exclude this KSA model cricket rifle as having fired the 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. Is that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, it is. My handy what's been marked for identification purposes is State's Exhibit DD608. State's Exhibit DD608, do you recognize the markings on that exhibit? Yes, again, I can identify the laboratory label placed on the end of the box. This corresponds to a Winchester Model 255 rifle. With respect to that exhibit, were you asked to compare that rifle to shell casings collected from the scenes and from the search warrant of 260 Peterson to see whether or not that, uh, that rifle had fired those shots? Yes, that's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes is State's Exhibit KK7. Mr. Junk, if I can get KK7. State's Exhibit KK7, can you tell the jury what they're looking at there? This particular picture is a microscopic comparison of test fires taken with the Winchester Model 255 rifle compared to the firing pin impression 
on the Fire 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. You'll notice the shape of the fine pin impression from the Winchester rifle is substantially different than the firing pin impression from the 20 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. That allowed me to be able to exclude this Winchester rifle as having fired any of the 22 long rifle cartridge cases. And was that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, that's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit DD610. State's Exhibit DD610. Do you recognize the markings on that item? Yes, sir, I do. Can you tell the jury what that is? This particular item is a Savage Model 93-22 rifle. And were you asked to compare that exhibit right there to shell cases collected from the scene and from the search warrant of 260 Peterson? Yes, sir, I was. Did you do that? I did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit KK-8. State's Exhibit KK-8, uh, do you recognize that? Yes. And can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit KK-8? This image depicts a test fire cartridge case it was taken with the Savage Model 93 rifle on the left side. The right side is the fired 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scene. You'll notice the shape of the fine pin impression of the Savage rifle was completely different than the shape of the fine pin impression present on the evidence 22 long rifle cartridge cases. That allowed me to be able to exclude, meaning they were not fired from this Savage rifle. And was that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Yes, sir, it is. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes as State's Exhibit DD604. State's Exhibit DD604. Do you recognize the markings on that item? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what that is, please? This is a Remington Model 522 Viper 22 rifle. And were you asked as part of your work in this case to compare that exhibit with shell casings collected from the scenes and 260 Peterson? Yes, I was. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, State's Exhibit KK9. State's Exhibit KK9, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what State's Exhibit KK9 is? This is a microscopic comparison on the left of the known test fire taken with the Remington Model 522 Viper rifle. On the right side is the Fire 22 long rifle cartridge case from the scenes. And again, you will notice the shape of the firing pin impression is completely different from the firing pin impression on the 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. That allowed me to be able to exclude the Remington rifle as having fired any of the 22 long rifle cartridge cases. And was that exclusion or that opinion to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Yes, sir, it is. In addition to looking at the 22s, were you also asked to look at uh, a rifle that was recovered that had the potential of firing a 30 caliber round? Yes, I was. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes at State's Exhibit DD628. Do you recognize State's Exhibit DD628? Yes, I do. And can you tell the jury what they're looking at with respect to State's Exhibit DD628? This particular item is a 1903 Springfield rifle chambered in 30 6 And did you look at that rifle and make any comparisons or draw any conclusions with respect to whether or not that rifle could have been responsible for shooting some of those uh, 30 cal projectiles that were found at scene one. Yes, uh, when this particular firearm was submitted for examination, I test fired the firearm. Uh, and as part of the collection, when I 
collected the test fired bullets that I took with this firearm, I noticed the rifling, the lands and grooves that were inside the barrel of the, of the rifle. It contained two lands and grooves. The 30 caliber bullets from scene one contained four lands and grooves. So due to the fact uh, they had a substantially different number of lands and grooves in this rifle versus the lands and grooves that were present on the 30 caliber bullets from scene one, I was able to exclude this rifle uh, on those class characteristics. It could not have fired the 30 caliber bullets due to the fact there's a different number of lands and grooves in that rifling. Again, based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, you said the projectiles recovered from the scene had four lands and grooves. Based on your knowledge, your training, your experience, are four lands and grooves consistent with having been fired from an SKS 7.62 by 39? Yes, that's correct. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as State's Exhibit HH-2. I want you to look at it, but don't say anything out loud about it. I'm just going to ask you some questions. Just take a second to review that item. Okay. Do you recognize firearms that you tested uh, from the search warrant at the Flying W Farms? with respect to make, model, and caliber. Do you recognize some of those make, models, and calibers as being present on that list? Yes, I do. Okay. And you can continue to hold that list and look at it. Do you also recognize under the name George in that list, is there a 762 by 39 listed? Objection. Objection. Yeah, no personal value. I'll rephrase the question. Is there an SKS 762 by 39 listed on that document? Objection. Overruled. Outside of its expertise. Okay. Your Honor, it's listed outside of its expertise. Yeah. He can look at the list and tell me whether or not it's listed. It's hearsay. He's testifying about what somebody else wrote. I'm sorry, say it again. It's hearsay. He's testifying about a list that somebody else prepared. It's beyond his expertise. I'm going to ask a follow-up question. I'm laying a foundation for this question. I'm going to overrule the objection. Let him answer that question. Whether or not it's on the list, whatever that would mean. But... Yes, there is an SKS 762 by 39 on the list. Under the name of George, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. As part of your work in this case, with respect to items collected from the Flying W Farms, were you given or asked to look at a 762 by 39 SKS? No, I was not. Is there also a 1911-22 listed on there? Yes, there is. Okay. And is that under the, whose name is that? That is the... Objection on the list. basis.
with respect to the 1911-22, is it identified any more than 1911-22? It is identified as Colt 1911-22. Whose name is that under? Jake's. And with respect to the items that were collected at the Flying W and given to you, did you, as part of your work, you just testified that you examined the, the 22s, were you given a Colt 1911-22 to, to, to examine? No, I was not. Is there also, on that list, a 40 caliber pistol pistol? Yes, there is. And as part of your work, Whose name is that listed under? George's. As part of your work in this case, examining evidence that was collected at the Flying W Farm, did you, or were you given a 40 caliber that was recovered? No, it was not. I'm going to hand you two exhibits. States exhibit, let's start with states exhibit DD616. Again, do you recognize the BCI markings on states exhibit DD616? Yes, the crime scene number is number 10. Can you do me a favor? Can you open that item and pull it out? Can you tell us what that is? Farm is safe and unloaded. This particular item is a Beretta Model 92 FS 9mm Luger pistol. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification purposes as States Exhibit DD618. Again, do you recognize BCI markings on 618? Yes, I do. DD618? Yes. And can you tell the jury how do you recognize those markings? Uh, identify the crime scene uh, number of 11 on it. Open it up, and again, can you remove the item that's in there? Can you make it safe? And can you tell the jury what that is? This is another Beretta Model 92 FS 9mm Luger pistol. Does it appear to be the same make and model as State's Exhibit DD616? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm going to take that from you. And if you could, pull the pistol out of DD-616, make it safe. Your Honor, can I have a witness come out? I want to show a couple differences in these. you ask him if he can leave the yes. witness chair yet? Okay. If you could, come on down. And again, do these pistols appear to be the same make and model? Yes, they are. Do you recognize, as you look at them, differences in the barrel? Yes, I do. Can you tell the jury what are the differences in the barrel associated with those two items? This particular barrel is not threaded, whereas this barrel is threaded. And what does that mean, threaded versus not threaded? If you look at the ends of the barrel, you'll notice the one has a circular ring device on it. This will unscrew. You'll be able to see the threads that are on the end of the barrel, as opposed to the other pistol is smooth. The end of the barrel is smooth. There's no threads that are cut onto that. The threads cut onto the barrel are cut to allow the attachment of some type of muzzle device. Okay, and when you say muzzle device, what are you, what are you talking about? A muzzle device can be a compensator, for example, or a suppressor. Uh, a compensator is a small piece of metal that has ports on it that can redirect the gas to help reduce recoil of the firing or firing, or a suppressor could be attached to it to decrease the sound uh, of the fire. This particular ring device is a thread protector that goes over top of the threads uh, when not in use to prevent damage from the thread, to thread occurring. And with respect to the threaded barrel, is that something that comes factory with that type of gun? Is it aftermarket or can it be either? It can be either. It can come uh, factory uh, threaded or non-threaded. You can buy factory threaded barrels and there's also aftermarket threaded barrels that you can purchase. Okay. Thank you. I 
have you replace. Let's, we can't put, you know, let's, let's look at the serial numbers before we put them back in the box. All right, I got 10. Check that serial number, make sure that it's the right one. Hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, States Exhibit DD622. <coughs> do you recognize, first of all, let me show you, do you recognize the BCI markings on States Exhibit DD622? I do. If you could, I can remove the item from the disc that exhibit. That exhibit. No, I don't see any. Okay. And even though there's no visible items, do you recognize that type or style of right? Yes, this particular style uh, appears to be a 303 infield bolt action rifle. Uh, it's chambered to fire a 303 British cartridge. Okay. And with respect to that rifle right there, again, what would you call the finish on, on the, the stock, I guess? Uh, it would just be a, a wood finish. Uh, I don't know the exact type of wood, but it's just a natural wood finish. Okay. Would you consider that a satin black by chance? No, it is not. Is it black? No, it is not. Okay. And with respect to State's Exhibit HH2, I'm going to hand you that list again. Again, do you recognize, under the name George, Objection. Well, leading, is that what you're going to? Uh, I'll just think. Look at how back it up with the Do you see? Any infield 303s on that? Yes, I do. Okay. And could you tell us uh, whose name the infield 303s are under? They're under George's name as well as Jake's name. And the ones under Jake's name, how are they uh, described? Infield Mark 1 303 satin black and infield Mark 2 303 black. And with respect to this weapon right here, does that meet the, either of those descriptions? No, it does not. Does this actually meet the description of the infield listed under George? The infield listed under George uh, does not contain uh, a color associated with it. Did you create a report documenting uh, the comparisons you did with the evidence from the Flying W? Yes, sir, I did. I'm going to hand you what's been marked for identification purposes, the State's Exhibit KK. State Exhibit KK. Uh, can you tell the jury, do you recognize that? I do. And can you tell the jury what that is? This is the final report issued involving the examination of the submitted firearms as well as the microscopic comparison of the test fires taken with those firearms to the Fire 22 long rifle cartridge cases 
from scenes two and three, as well as 260 Peterson. As part of your duties there, or part of your work there at BCI, do you have a business duty to create and maintain those types of reports? Yes, sir, I do. And that exhibit right there, State's Exhibit KK, was that created and maintained in the course of, ordinary course of your business there at BCI? Yes, sir, it was. Nothing further. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good to see you again. You as well. States Exhibit HH2. Do you have that in front of you? Then it should be in Bristol. Thank you. States Exhibit HH2. This you've testified about this just a few moments ago, correct? Yes, this is the list that I was provided. All right. Do you know who, do you know who made up that list? I do not. Do you know when it was made? I do not. Are you saying that the items on that list are here in the courtroom? I am not. Did you, talking about the crime scenes now, just for a moment, did you see any evidence in what you reviewed from the four homicide crime scenes of a 12-gauge shotgun being used? I did not. What about a 50 caliber weapon? I did not. What about a 9 millimeter weapon? I did not. All right. And the 22 uh, caliber weapons you've identified here in the courtroom are not related to the homicides in any way, shape, or form. Is that what you're telling the jury? They are all excluded as having fired the 22 long rifle cartridge cases from the scenes. All right. I can have just a moment. more questions, sir. Uh, concerning the crime scenes, you did identify a 40 caliber weapon, correct? From the list, there's a 40 about caliber weapon. I'm talking about the crime scene. Yes, You were able correct. to identify a 40 caliber weapon was used, is that right? Yes, scenes one and four. Right, and did you determine what type of gun fired, was fired uh, at those scenes? Yes, based off the characteristic on the fired 40 caliber cartridge cases, and the 40 caliber bullets are consistent with having been fired from a Glock pistol. All right. And on this list, HH2, there is a Beretta listed for a 40 caliber. Is that right? Yes, the list indicates a Beretta. 96, 40 caliber. Thank you, sir. I have no other questions. Any redirect? Mr. White? Were you provided all of the guns that were collected in the Flying W to, to examine? No, it was not. And do you know whether or not a 12 gauge was collected at the Flying W. I do not. But there's a 12 gauge on that list, right? Yes, there is. And do you know whether or not there was a, uh, I think Mr. Parker asked you about a 50 caliber Thompson, a, a 50 caliber? Yes, nothing was submitted to the laboratory. No. But you don't know whether or not that was collected as part of that? No, I do not. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Nothing further, thank you. All right, you may step down. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be recessing for the day. Uh, I've got one special instruction for tomorrow morning. So the court sometimes has things uh, that, I, uh, that we get involved with that do not involve the jury. And uh, so I'm going to have him come in one half hour later tomorrow morning, 930, to the, to the jury room. Uh, rather than just have you wait down there, I'm going to have him come in half an hour later. 
the, uh, you'll be going home, and so it's very important you follow the instructions of the court, and that is uh, you're not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. You're not to permit uh, anyone to discuss this case with you or to discuss this case in your presence. You're not to form or express an opinion concerning this case until it's finally submitted to you for deliberation and verdict. You are to do no research at all from any source at all concerning this case, either as to the facts or as to the law. You're not to view, uh, read, or listen to any reports or accounts of this case from any source at all. And as I've said many times, that, that includes newspapers, radio, and television, but it also includes uh, Facebook, other, other internet-type sources, uh, or social media-type things. Uh, all those, you need to refrain from all of that. And of course, you have no contact with any participants in the case, including parties, uh, counsel, and witnesses. Now, does counsel for either side have anything for, uh, that you want to bring on the record here before we adjourn until tomorrow morning at 9.30? State has out of here, Thank you. Right. So with that, we are in adjournment. The jury will report at 9.30 to the jury room downstairs. Leave your notepads on your, at the, on your seat to take where you're watching. Uh, as I indicated before, I'll need counsel here at any